we just make a couple few seconds. Covers are up. We are okay. Uh, just a question to the chair. Uh, I've just noticed some of us have just seen the sort of the uh, order of business firm. Yeah. So. So um, this is about, the, are you referring to the order paper for next week? Yes. Uh, and the budget bill? So yeah. can I suggest that we uh, now, as a, as a bit of, because we'll ask the clerk to give us a quick run through. It might be germane for when we've got It will be. So um, we are looking at agreeing an additional meeting on Monday. Um, that will be at 12, because I've just seen the timings. Um, so essentially we have that already arranged and booked provisionally. We just need members' agreement to have that. And members agree to be briefed then by officials from DOF around the budget bill, which will be seeking accelerated passage. That will be flagged up today when we have the briefing with the officials. Yeah. But it's important if members can get noon, room 29, on Monday the 19th in their diary, we will get a briefing from the department around this budget bill. As I say, they'll be seeking accelerated passage. If you look at the, um, the Monday and Tuesday order papers, there will be an introduction before we have our meeting, or around the same time, as soon as plenary starts, that's just a one minute introduction, that's not germane to the committee needing to be there. The ideal for us is we finish the committee meeting before they go to second stage at 1.37, so uh, we're starting at noon, and 1.37 should give us enough time to get the briefing and for the committee to decide what it wants to do. The other thing probably to flag up is the budget bill is the only bill that can be granted a set accelerated passage by the committee exclusively. Okay. Any other budget, but any other bill can be brought to the floor. Only the budget bill requires committee agreement for okay. accelerated passage. Thank you, Clark. I'm just going to park that now. In the future, obviously, uh, I'd rather business didn't come up whenever just because it was on an email. But but we will we will have an opportunity to to, to talk about that later in the session. So um, uh, I will publicly now welcome everybody to the first proper sitting of. The Finance Committee in uh, uh, not quite a new mandate, but it's a, we are we are here in 2024 rather than 2022. But uh, welcome everybody. So um, uh, uh, just so everyone's aware, obviously uh, the committee will be recorded and broadcast uh, throughout Parliament buildings and online. Um, uh, members and those in the public gallery, which isn't too many because we're in a relatively small room, are welcome to use. In fact, I don't think it's anybody, but if there is anybody no. for future reference, if there is anybody for future reference. Um, uh, you're welcome to use. Uh, you're welcome to use That's mobile devices um, as long as the. Can I just have order in the committee, and we we'll sort of uh, we will um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do things through the chair. Um, if if you want to use a mobile device, um, make sure it's on airplane mode. It can connect to assembly Wi-Fi and password details are available. So um, uh, we did make a number of decisions in closed sessions. So we're just going to read them into the record for um, uh, for for good order. Uh, the committee noted uh, that arrangements for committee meet uh, noted our arrangements for committee meetings, including when we will meet. Uh, the committee meetings will be held in public session unless uh, the committee agrees that there's an overriding reason for proceedings to be closed. We noted staff contact details. We noted the um, outcomes of an effective committee. Uh, we agreed a committee approach to dealing with correspondence and requests for meetings which are not linked to the strategic priorities or our statutory duties. We agreed a committee approach to preparation and witness questioning. We agreed to adopt a committee protocol on conduct and courtesy at committee meetings, and obviously we'll all um, be following that uh, with, um, with, with due uh, regard. We noted the committee approach to the use of social media and how uh, those, uh, including the Twitter account, will be used. I think I should call it an X account now, actually, if we're being... Is, if for, the, for the record, I should probably get um, Elon Musk's um, awful company's name on the record. Okay, uh, agenda item three is apologies. I don't think we have any apologies yeah, today. We've got, we've got a full house. Um, uh, item four, I think we have decided to move. Chair, if, um, if members are content, Chair, if we move uh, agenda item four to the end of the meeting to get to the briefing quicker. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, sure. and, and, and in Chairperson's business, we can also have a further discussion about what was raised, which is the um, <laughs> matter surrounding the budget bill. And of course, that might come up in our uh, questioning of the department around what they are planning in terms of budget bills and timing, so we can talk. We can follow up some of that in uh, in chairperson's business. Um, agenda item five is declaration of interests. So can I refer members to page one five nine of your pack, and um, you will all uh, be aware that assembly members, all assembly members, are required to um, uh, register all relevant financial and other interests in the register of members' interests. Details of the interests are um, uh, published on the Assembly website. 
Um, and I would remind members that in addition to this requirement standing order 69.5, I'll go through this in our first meeting, but obviously I won't go through this all this, uh, as it were, rigmarole before every single uh, hearing. I'll invite people to, elect, to, to declare their interest. But for the record, standing order 69.5 states a member who has A, a financial interest in any matter, or B, a relevant interest in any matter must declare that interest before taking um, part in, um, must declare that interest before taking part in any proceedings of the Assembly relating to that matter. In particular, there's a requirement to declare any interest which might reasonably be thought by others to influence the member's approach to the matter under consideration. Um, and proceedings, members includes member meetings of this committee. Uh, so, members, this as this is the first meeting of the committee, uh, members should ensure that any financial or other interests which relate to the remit of the committee or which are likely to be relevant to a substantial part of its work are drawn to the attention of the committee. Um, it should be noted that any failure to register and or declare an interest may be an offence under section 43 of the Northern Ireland Act. God, I feel very official there. Um, so I'm going to ask, does anybody have any relevant uh, interest to declare? No, but through, through the Steve? chair, if there is something that comes up because of the wealth of data and the rest of it, I would make a declaratory interest if I've read something that I haven't by yes. I haven't been able to look at the 1,435 pages of, to get the right thing. Of course, that's fine. And, and obviously, anybody, if if something comes up or you're you're reminded of a particular interest, then it could be voluntary, it could be historic. Feel free to declare that interest as we go along. That's that's completely fine. And um, the clerk will record any declaration of interests uh, made by members in the minutes of the first meeting. Um, uh, remind members that the rules governing the registration and declaration of interests are contained in the Code of Conduct and guide to the rules relating to the conduct of members and the further advice is available from the Clerk of Standards um, in Room 254. Okay, anyone that wants to raise any questions on all of that with the Clerk? Otherwise, we will move to agenda Item 6, which is uh, committee membership. Ask members to note committee membership at page 162 of the meeting packs. You can all see one another and read the name signs in front of you so that we should, and probably all knew one another were going to be here. Um, agenda item seven, we have discussed this I think a little already, but, um, uh, or some of this already, but members can note uh, the following guidance papers um, which uh, include uh, 7.1 guide to the powers and operation of statutory committees for chairpersons and members, which is page 164 of the meeting pack. Guide to the role of the chairperson, page 187 of the meeting pack, which I have obviously read about five times now and I'll read again um, uh, tonight. Uh, 7.3, which is guide for members on the role and functions of the committee office, uh, which is at page 198 of the meeting pack. And obviously uh, the clerk and the team are available if anybody wants to follow up with any queries, either now or, um, or, or later, preferably later. So um, I will uh, draw members' attention in particular to the guidance uh, which um, uh, guidance on privilege and matters that are sub judice under section 50 of the quote under section 50 of the Northern Ireland Act 1988 the purposes of the law of defamation uh, for the purposes of the law of defamation absolute privilege applies equally to the making of a statement in proceedings of the assembly and the publication of a statement under the assembly's authority this privilege and this is actually important and um, some of us have uh, um, uh, had to uh, discover this Privilege also extends to the meetings of the committee. Members should note, however, that absolute privilege does not extend to press conferences or statements made to the press. So these are privileged. Statements you make in this room are privileged, meaning you, you have the same rights um, uh, in this committee chamber, I'm right in saying, as you would do in the full chamber of the Assembly. Uh, so, um, But I would remind you of the, the, the issues of the potential problems associated um, and, the, and I'm quoting again from the guidance, Me committee members should be aware of the potential problems associated with discussing a matter that is sub judice, uh, that is a matter which is being or is about to be considered by a court. The sub judice rule is contained in Standing Order 73. It provides that any matters in respect of which legal pro proceedings are, quote, active, should not be referred to in committee proceedings, except to the extent permitted by the committee chairperson. In such cases, the matter uh, awaiting adjudication should not be prejudiced by comment in a public session of a committee meeting. I mean, it's worth just saying here, uh, and this did come up in the previous uh, committee, there were matters that were not um, necessarily uh, judicial, they, were, they didn't involve the, a judicial process, but they did involve uh, confidentiality, and therefore there were potential legal ramifications. If we are discussing those things, we will go into closed session, and I think for everyone's, um, for the purposes of, of, of having frank discussions, but also um, uh, you know, avoiding getting being in violation of these of this guidance, we will, uh, at our earliest available, uh, 
uh, opportunity to go into closed session, not in order to be closed as a principle, but because I think that's proper order. Uh, the rules relating to this are summarised in the Guide to the Powers and Operation of Statutory Committees for Chairpersons and Members that members have been provided to page 162 of your pack. So, uh, I'm going to draw your attention to guidance on the language and simultaneous interpretation uh, arrangements which have been put in place by the Assembly Commission uh, and allow for simultaneous and passive interpretation of Irish and Ulster Scots spoken in Assembly proceedings. On non-plenary days, the service can be permitted at no more than one committee meeting at any one time and is not available to support committee business uh, on any days when plenary is sitting. Um, Members should therefore be aware uh, that it uh, may not be possible to provide the service in response to all requests. Any member wishing to have their comments in Irish or Ulster Scots interpreted during committee proceedings should inform the clerk at least five working days in advance of the meeting for which the service is being requested and specify the relevant agenda item. Witnesses wishing to have their comments in Irish or Ulster Scots interpreted during committee proceedings will be expected to inform the clerk at the time of confirming their attendance at the meeting. So that's, that's just to confirm. If you do want to um, make remarks and have them simultaneously translated in Irish or Ulster Scots, um, please uh, inform the, the, current, the, the clerk Chair, with just five working days. Also to stress the reason for that is it can only work in room 29. So it's got all okay. the stuff um, okay. to make that happen. So we don't have headphones that, here. We don't have the technology. We don't have, technology here. We just don't have the technology okay, so in this do, room. Okay. So that's where they, the, the lead-in time is. And we just then need to swap. Okay. Um, so members, standing order 78 um, provides, and this is a um, just a very positive step step forward in my view and, and view of others uh, that we may that members may speak in the language of their choice. However, simultaneous interpretation is not is not provided as outlined in the guidance. A member who uh, speaks in a language other than English must provide a full and accurate translation of their remarks. I presume that isn't the, in, in the case where they haven't pre they that's haven't our, informed. Yeah, that's our default, the way it's always yes. been. If, if people speak in, in Irish or Ulster Scots, they then translate themselves. Yes. That's so that, kind of that doesn't apply if, the, if they have given notice and yeah. we are... And we've got room 29. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Highlight to members, the only committee room with this facility, i.e. the facility for simultaneous translation is 29, which is down the corridor. Uh, guidance on timescales for interaction between committees and departments. Um, members, please note the guidance at page 202 of the meeting pack, which sets out the timescales for the provision of information and evidence between departments and committees and was agreed by the Executive and Assembly Chairpersons Liaison Group. Um, I would say that um, that is a custom more followed in the, in my experience, a custom more followed in the honoured in the breach than the observance, certainly in relation to departments, but hopefully maybe this, this time will be different, you never know, yeah. certainly in relation to departments. Yeah. Um, seven point, uh, so that is in uh, 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 guidance on, um, sorry, moving on to guidance at page 208 of the meeting pack, which is on handling of subordinate legislation, uh, and that is <coughs> page 208, so I'll refer members to that. Uh, agenda item 8 is delegation of technical scrutiny to the um, ESR, the Examiner of Statutory Rules, who we've just heard from. So members, as outlined, in, as outlined in the earlier briefing, the Assembly's uh, Examiner of Statutory Rules undertakes the technical scrutiny of subordinate legislation, leaving the policy scrutiny to the Committee. In order to facilitate the above, um, I will need to put the following motion to the Committee, um, and I'll read it out to you, quote, that the Committee of Finance for Finance, Understanding Order 43, resolves to delegate to the Examiner of Statutory Rules the technical scrutiny of statutory rules referred to the committee under the above mentioned standing order. The committee further resolves that in carrying out this function, the examiner shall be authorised to report her technical findings on each statutory rule to the committee, sorry, to the assembly and to the relevant department, as well as to the committee itself and to publish her report. Our members agreed. Great, great. great. I'm glad you agreed to that because we would have had. Our time would have been a lot longer in this uh, committee. I don't think we would have been home to sleep if we had not agreed that. So, members, uh, a number of statutory rules have been laid during the period of suspension, um, uh, which are still within the statutory period for committee, uh, committee consideration. They're in your packs, and they will be covered uh, later in today's meeting. We move legacy to the end as well, if members are content. If members are content, that we will move agenda item uh, 9, as suggested by the clerk. Uh, the legacy report is the report that the previous uh, committee talk through and indeed I and indeed we have a couple of other members from the committee who might want to comment on uh, on some of the experience and we, we can probably do it with a little less time pressure if we do it after our main um, evidence session. Now agenda item 10 is um, SL1 the rates brackets regional rates order brackets Northern Ireland 2024 uh, which is a page 243 in your packs. 
Uh, the Department of Finance is proposing to make a statutory rule which will stipulate the regional rate for domestic and non-domestic property that will apply for the 2024-2025 rating year. Full details uh, can be found uh, in the briefing note at page 244 of the meeting pack. Uh, members, the SL1 is a policy proposal to take forward a regional rate. So this is to take forward a regional rate. The executive will still need to agree the poundage multipliers in the context of their wider approach to the budget settlement for 2024-2025. This will be provided at a later date. So I think it's worth saying to people here, you're not agreeing the regional rate at this point. You're agreeing that. So I don't want people to think that this is um, that that's what's happening here. Um, the proposed statutory rule will be subject to affirmative resolution. So. Uh, can I ask uh, for the views of members um, and given the context uh, of the uh, proposed statutory rule, a briefing will be uh, a briefing with the, with the, from the department will be sought on this particular issue. We got that next week, and that's coming next week. Okay. I don't know, Jerry. Do we need rates? I don't know. Um, we probably do, but probably not as high as you want the reason. Right? So, <laughs> having, having had that <laughs> nice little bit of next week, just, just an insight into the kind of back and forth debate <laughs> we'll have on this committee. Uh, members, um, you will now be asked to consider a number of statutory rules which were made and laid, if that was a, a deliberate rhyme, well done, Clark, I like that, during the dissolution of the Assembly. Um, uh, therefore, the committee was not in existence to consider the policy proposals which would normally uh, be submitted at SL1 stage. And the examiner, the examiner of statutory rules has indicated that her report on the technical aspects of the rules uh, will not be published in time for today's meetings. Therefore, any agreements on the rules today will be subject to the examiner of statutory rules report. It is worth saying if the ESR comes back mm -hmm. with a really profound concern about one of these, um, we will have the opportunity Absolutely. to discuss it. I think it's safe to say just from, from what we heard previously and I'm not breaking confidence is that nothing controversial has been flagged up. But bearing in mind the ESR scrutiny is technical, not policy. But I think it's worth, and I, as Chair, would reassure members that um, given the, the particular circumstances, they will have the opportunity, if based on the ESR report there are particular concerns they want to raise, they can bring them back to this committee and that would be entirely in order and, 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 and legitimate. So we will now go through um, from agenda item 11 onwards. Um, so uh, agenda item 11 is SR 2022-24, public service pensions, uh, em uh, brackets, employer cost cap and specified restrict restricted scheme regulations brackets Northern Ireland 2022. Uh, the department has laid a rule which will adjust the cost control mechanism for public sector pension schemes to plus or minus 3%. This rule will also remove the judicial pension scheme from the actuarial revaluation process. Full details can be found in the briefing note at page 250 of this meeting pack. Uh, the briefing note also covers uh, the next couple of agenda items. Um, this rule is subject to negative resolution assembly procedure and it came into effect way back in, on the 16th of September 2022. Uh, are members content with the statutory rule? Content. content. If they are content, uh, then I need to put the question, I'm going to be doing a lot of this, I think I'll need to get through a lot of water after this, that the Committee for Finance has considered SR 204, sorry, 2024-2022, uh, uh, the Public Service Pensions Employer Cost Cap and Specified Restricted Scheme brackets, uh, regula Regulations brackets Northern Ireland 2022, and subject to the report of the Examiner of Statute Rules, has no objection to the rule. Chair, for speed, don't need to mention brackets. Very good. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm leaving with the brackets now. Um, uh, agenda item 12 is the Public Service Pensions Directions, um, Exercise of Powers, Compensation and Information Directions, NI 2023. Uh, members, in February 23, the Department of Finance wrote to the committee in relation to uh, making the Public Service Pensions Directions, Exercise of Powers, Compensation and Information Directions, 2023. These refer to the Public Service Pension Schemes in NI and are designed to reflect the McLeod Judgment and the related legislation which removes age discrimination in respect of the transfer of public sector pension schemes from final salary to career average arrangements. Uh, these directions are not subject to any assembly procedure and therefore they are for noting only, but I just, did someone want to come in on that? Sorry, Church Phoenicians, should I ask a question on it? Yeah. Uh, you can, well, you can ask a question on this one now if you wish, Jim. Yeah, sure. Uh, it's 2 2 3 54. yeah. So just a question, basically looking through the, the papers, um, and my understanding of it is that most public sector pension rates are based on CPI, 
uh, and currently 10.1%. Mm. I think it's a different one. I think you're talking about a different. Well, I think we're are you? Five, four. Further down. Further down. Yeah, no, you're a couple. You're on 15. You're, you're further ahead. Oh, sorry, you're 15. Further you're sorry. Uh, no, it's fair enough. Well, you, you can, we're on 12. Well, that, we'll let, I'll let you come in on that just one. Yeah, sure. That's 12. Um, so actually, this is 11. There's we're a on. lot of very similar. There's a lot of pension. Really and then some of them yeah. will come. We will come back. And I, I assume at some point we'll probably have to discuss McLeod again because this is a. A, a very long running it does issue. Have several run with that. One. Yeah. So if if you if you're not getting, the, don't worry. You'll have to, you will get to talk about McLeod again yes. at some point, and it is very very te- it's very important, and it's very costly. It's very um uh, it's very technical. Okay. Um. So uh, agenda item thirteen is. I just sorry, through the chair. Yes. Sort of Steve. The McLeod issue. Like, sort of. What are we actually agreeing to on this McLeod issue? This because. We aren't agreeing, well, there is no assembly procedure for for um, number twelve purely because yeah. that's a legal ruling. Therefore, it it's automatic, and we aren't necessarily the committee. Sorry, not we. The committee um, aren't really involved in that decision because it's a judicial judgment. It has to happen. This is the vehicle for it to happen. But there's no assembly procedure because it's a judicial judgment. Subsequent um, SRs deal with it in different angles. I don't know how how familiar are members chair with the McLeod judgment. Would a briefing be useful? If people, if it, I, I would suggest if people do want a separate briefing on McLeod. So McLeod is, um, even if I started trying to give an explanation, I would. It's, it's, it's very, yeah, it's very, it's very technical. Complex. It's to do with the court case a number yes. of years ago and differences between here, but it's but it, but it, it involves public sector pensions but and other parts of you through can, the chair, but also yes, for the rest of the committee. I mean, there are substantial cost issues that are still yes. rumbling through the budgetary process. There are, so I think we should. I think we should say scheduling a, a briefing would probably yeah, be sure. wise. Loans, okay, loans, yeah. so you can take that away. Years, Park, thank take you. That so. Um, now, agenda item 13 is the public service pensions, valuations on employer cost cap, directions, NI 2023. In a similar vein, the department wrote to the committee in relation to making the public service pensions, uh, valuations on employer cost cap directions, uh, NI 23. The directions apply the judgment to the cost control mechanism for all public sector pension schemes to plus minus 3% in line with SR 204 slash 2022, uh, which the committee has just agreed. Um, well, actually, the committee just noted rather than than, yeah. than agreeing because we didn't. We, it was not for us to agree. The the directions also make a series of technical changes. Full details are in the cover note at page two fifty um, of the meeting pack. Um, once again, these directions are not subject to any assembly procedure, and therefore they're just for noting. Now, agenda item fourteen is. Uh, SR 2023-141, the Public Service Pension, Civil Servants and Others, Pensions, Remedial Service, Regulations, Northern Ireland 2023. The Department has laid a rule which will offer those entitled to public service pensions between 1st of April 2015 and 31st of uh, March 2022 a choice of PCSPSNI or Alpha Benefits, benefits for this period. Full details and background to this policy can be found at page 293 so apologies, of the meeting pack. The rule came into operation uh, on 1st of um, October 2023 and is subject to negative resolution. Um, if, if members are content with the statutory rule, um, if members are content, I will put the question uh, that the Committee for Finance has considered SR 141-2023, uh, the Public Service Pensions, Civil Servants and Others, Pensions, Remedial Service, Regulations, Northern Ireland 2023, and subject to the rule of the Examiner of Statutory Rules has no objection to the rule. Okay, now agenda item 15 is SR 2023-54, the Public Service Pensions uh, Revaluation Order. Uh, the Department has made and laid a rule to set the revaluation rate for various public sector pensions. I will bring you in on this now, um, Jerry Carroll. Most of the pension scheme revaluation rates are based on the consumer price index, 10.1% for the relevant year, uh, 10.1% for the relevant year. Um, one pension scheme, firefighters uh, scheme, one the firefighter scheme is based on average weekly earnings, which is 7% for the relevant year. Full details can be found at page 666, slightly troubling, of the meeting pack. <laughs> The rule is subject to negative resolution uh, and came into effect on 1st of April, a troubling date, 2023. Uh, ask members if they are content with the statutory rule. Thanks, Jerry, Carl. Yeah, just a bit of clarification because I was looking through this obviously in preparation of the meeting and there's a differentiation as you indicated between 
all public sector workers and, and mm-hmm. firefighters yeah. um, and that obviously would be concerning um, if there's a higher pension rate for some and, and at all there's no level of playing field so um, I mean generally speaking all workers should be paid at the highest possible rate so uh, are we endorsing the current policy if we by agreeing this um, SR um, is a note in it um, and I know I think the department contacted um, at least the FBU as far as I understand but I'm not aware of their full input uh, into this process so Concern about the the policy in terms of the implications of it, but you know, and I, I'm unaware just in terms of like the procedure of, of the committee today. If we accept this, are we accept that policy that's problematic for myself and maybe others. So I would st- well, for, first of all, for, for, I, 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 it might be that there may be an historic reason why one pension scheme uses uh, like a particular inflation measure versus another. It might not be a kind of political decision. Um, obviously, some use. You know, RPIs used for certain things, CPIs used for other things, um, but I think appropriately in order for the committee to write. Absolutely, yeah. this is historical. The, the the public sector pension only covers certain um, professions. It, it's a huge amount of the public sector, but the likes of firefighters mm-hmm. have always historically been in a separate system. Um, but if, if members are content, we can. We've probably got enough. We've still got plenary time on that one. So we can take it out and look at it again. It may be okay, but I think it's maybe good practice going ahead that there's no Uh, better issues. Yes, we can take it out and re... re Sorry, sorry, through the chair. I'm I'm generally quite nervous about us going through this and sort of this pension thing, and I think we should be taking more time if we can. Um, Can Can I suggest, in that case, on this specific SI, or SR I should say, that we write to uh, the relevant department or departments and ask... They just write to TOF and they can find out. Yeah, and, and they, can, yeah. they can find out for us what the historic... Re- and after that, we will be able to make a decision about who would be a, whether it's appropriate to, to investigate further. Jerry? So, in addition, sure, through, through you, and, and if members agree, we'll contact the FBU as well, I'd say maybe more aware than yeah. the department, additionally. Totally fine, that makes sense. Thanks. Jerry, can I just check, <clears throat> what date did this... Come into effect. So this came into effect uh, on first of April last year, so the start of the tax year last year. Yeah. So how is the committee then? The going? committee. This is where it becomes complicated. I think it's it's a case of understanding, but uh, the the committee in doing this, if if the committee sought to undo the yes, answer, and that's where the writing and the briefing would be useful. Effectively, would be creating a complication in terms of the pension system working out and being paid. But we should be aware of that. Yeah, of course, I think that's. I mean, that's a pretty reasonable point to make. People, this is already what is now you, you calculated for people's pensions, but that well, doesn't mean. But that doesn't mean that people can, we can't. Add, we can always ask for more. Information. But also, having said that, chair, this will come back again. So therefore, the briefing and so on is still relevant, and it allows members then to be better prepared for the next one coming round. So, I think in reality, yes, trying to undo that yeah. would be. I've never seen it done, and it would be okay. fascinating. Uh, yeah, just well, not fascinating. No, but you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. But this would be effectively understanding it better. That this is where a lot of these are going to become complicated, because they are they're technically not past the post, but they are. Yeah. So, in terms of anything that runs on the financial year that's already happened, to undo that would be very very. I'm happy that you know we get a briefing, but I just don't want. Um, this committee to get into a position where we're undoing pension contributions and pensions that have already been in place for... Uh, can, I, can I suggest, I'll, I'll come to you in a second, Steve. I, I think it's important that we give, particularly given that this has been down for a couple of years, that we give members the opportunity to test and ask questions, even if there is very limited practical route to undoing, and it would be, the, the, I'm not prejudging what comes back, but I think it's reasonable for a member to ask for more information given we're pretty hurtling through these so I think it's totally reasonable and, and I think I, as a chair certainly I would always give that in, like, indulgence to, 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 to anybody who wanted to, to find out more information we then as a committee will have a decision to make about for example is it a good use of our time to have uh, evidence sessions or things like that as the clerk said it will be coming back this is a, obviously comes this is a statutory we have we have a role in remaking this rule every time it comes up so we will have the, the opportunity to debate and scrutinize it in more detail um, at that point, Steve. Yeah, it's just my concerns is, you know, I've had concerns raised to me by the Northern Ireland Prison Service and sort of prison service pensions people that's been out of whack. Mm-hmm. And previously when we have gone through these at sort of a rate because we never get them sufficiently on time, it's discovered that subsequently there's been issues and across all of the public service where some of the things have been that, you know, it wasn't 
us looking as we should have done appropriately to ask ask the questions. I just have a degree of nervousness is that this habit seems to have redeveloped itself. And bearing in mind, I think previously in this committee, the Northern Ireland Civil Service HR, we had questions about pensions then. And I don't think that they've made the changes they said they were going to make. So I've got, I've, I've I, I'm just, I'm, Chair, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, the rest of the members of the committee, I'm really sorry about this, but I'm feeling quite nervous about this. Well, I, I think it's worth saying, Steve, I mean, I'm nervous about the fact that we were never changed. A lot of these changes are literally already being implemented in people's pension packets, so that, though, in a sense, we, you know, some of this has already happened, but it's completely reasonable for us to get a briefing on exactly. how it's happened and, what, and, and, and the broader rules and the broader picture around indexation of specific pension schemes. And I think what I would suggest to members are content is the clerk uh, drafts a letter to the Department of Finance and in specific case the FBU, as Mr Carroll suggests. Uh, we will then get a response and we will discuss that response and discuss how we proceed as a committee. We, because, and in that discussion we can have you know, we can take advice on when we are again likely to to have a more substantive, forward-looking. You know, when when this, the, the next statute rule will come to us, for example, and it's not like nearly a year after it's already been implemented and it's in people's pay packets, and we have a slightly more substantive opportunity to scrutinise. If so, but we will do. We will have. We will come back on all these things. But I'm happy to take questions as we go through. Um, do I need to? Have I, I'm, I'm now I need to check whether I've read the relevant bit out. Do I need to do it again, Clark, or I? Um, I have to because I haven't gone. I think I've, I don't think I've put the question. You've got as far as the question. Okay, so I'll put the question, which is that the committee for finance has uh, committed SR has considered SR five four twenty twenty three, the public service pensions revaluation order, uh, Northern Ireland twenty twenty three, and subject to the report of the uh, examiner statute rules, has no objection to the rule. Okay, I see no objection. So agenda item. Sorry, now can I record my objection? Okay, we should record your okay, objection. Do you, want, do you want to put this to a manual vote? I'm just, because it kind of contradicts sort of Charlie to the proposal, you know, not to be... I think okay. that, you know, I think we should get a... Do, uh, we, do we have to put it to a vote today? Yeah, can we get the evidence to come back to a vote? Yeah. 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 If you want to just take this one out of the... So, uh, if, you want, if, if you wish, we can take, we can defer this to a future setting, this particular SR, um, now we will be, you know, to, to be to be clear, we are debating an SR which has already been implemented. <laughs> but so um, we're not. But but, but but I'm happy to do that once we have uh, further information, or we can take a vote today and people can record their objection or dissent. But could it Yeah, no. For a point, if people want the additional information, it just needs to be prompt. Then the follow up, yes. the fact that this is a legacy piece, it's okay. Maybe informing ourselves going forward, but if it can come back around, if we can get a time scale as to when. We, we'll attempt to at least give the DOF response as part of the Dallow readout. The letter to the FB will be separate, yeah. um, but I'm sure they'll be very keen to communicate with us quickly and we can yeah. do as much as we can around pushing that on. Okay, Okay. so, so just to say, what we're doing is deferring the question until we have that sure. further briefing. That, that doesn't... That doesn't that's not going to. No, that's not going to. Given they've been, they've been waiting, they've been in this position for nearly a year. So, can I suggest, Clark, that on agenda item we do the same thing for agenda item sixteen? I think it would be good to get full some advice on both, rather than um, even though that's just we don't need to actually formally approve that. We just have to note it. So, agenda item sixteen, we will, along with the previous one, fifteen, we will. Yeah, we write on both. We will those. write and defer and formally put. Well, we'll put a question and note for the other one. Okay, moving on to agenda item seventeen. Uh, and the 18, which we'll take together. Uh, the um, now, people, anybody who is uh, geeky enough to want to call in the whole of government accounts, I will take my hat off to you because it's something that I had to deal with in previous life. Uh, and it is extremely. I suspect me, Paul Freewell. SR 2020 uh, 220, the whole of government accounts designation of bodies and agenda item uh, 18, as I said, SR 2023. 89, the whole of government accounts designation of bodies. Now, this is very important, um, uh, notwithstanding um, the fact that it is uh, very technical. The Department has made two statutory rules to enable uh, the Department of Finance to request information from listed departments and bodies for onward transmission to HM Treasury for use in the preparation of the whole of government accounts. Full details of those bodies covered by the rules can be found in the briefing notes at pages 6, 8, 6 and 700 of the meeting pack. Um, these rules are subject to negative resolution, um, uh, negative resolution assembly procedure, and came into operation on 13th October 2022 and 28th of June 
2023. Um, before I ask members if they're content with their statute rule, are there any comments or questions about the Wolf Government Accounts? Okay, in that case, uh, um, members are content. Uh, I will put the question, which is that the Committee for Finance has considered SR 2022, the Whole of Government Accounts Designation of Bodies Order, uh, 2022, and are sub and are and subject to the report of the examiner's statutory rules, has no objection to the rule. And also, the second question, that the Committee for Finance has considered SR 89 slash 2023, the Whole of Government Accounts Designation of Bodies Order 2023, and subject to the rule of the report of the examiner's statutory rules, has no objection to the rule. Thank you. Colleagues, now moving on to agenda items 19 to 21. Uh, the department has made three statutory rules under powers conferred by the Government Resources and Accounts NI Act 2001, the Granny Act, um, two, uh, uh, 2022 slash 256 and 2023 slash 53, designates the bodies for inclusion in the departmental estimates and accounts for year ending. 31st of March 2023 and 31st of March 2024, respectively. 2024 slash 7 makes amendments to those bodies designated under uh, 2023 slash 53. Full details of bodies included and removed by the rules can be found uh, in the meeting pack at page 7 to 1. These rules are subject to negative resolution uh, assembly procedure and came into effect on the 11th of November 2022. Uh, 19th of April 2023 and respectively uh, 8th of February 2024. Are members content with the statutory rules? If the, if the committee is content, I'm going to put the question, which is um, that the, first of all, that the Committee for Finance has um, considered SR 256 slash 2022, the Government Resources and Accounts Northern Ireland Act 2001, Estimates and accounts designation of bodies order 2022 and subject to the report of the examiner statutory rules has no objection to the rule. Content. Yeah. Content. <coughs> Content. Secondly, that the Committee for Finance has considered SR 53 2023, the Government Resources and Accounts Northern Ireland Act 2001, designation of bodies order 2023 and subject to the report of the examiner statutory rules has no objection to the rule. <coughs> Members are content? Content. 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 That the Committee of Finance has considered SR 7 slash 2024, Government Resources and Accounts Northern Ireland Act 2001, Estimates and Accounts, Designation of Bodies Order 2024, and subject to the report of the Examiner Statutory Rules, has no objection to the rule. Content. I was hoping someone would have an objection there to give me a break, but anyway. Um, agenda item 20. Excellent. <clears throat> Excellent. Well, well, indeed. Agenda item 22. The Coronavirus Act, which is the Coronavirus Act, um, Registration of Deaths and Stillbirths Extension, uh, Northern Ireland Order 2022. The S, uh, Agenda Matter 23 is SR 2023-49, the Coronavirus Act 2020, Registration of Deaths and Stillbirths, Births Extension Order, Northern Ireland 2023, and uh, SR, tw and Agenda tw Item 24, which is SR 2023-137, the Coronavirus Act, Registration of Deaths and Stillbirths. So, Department of Finance laid three statutory rules under powers conferred by the Coronavirus Act 2020. <clears throat> Excuse me, all of the rules are subject to confirmatory resolution procedure. These rules extended provisions which were first enacted during the pandemic, allowing for registration of death by telephone and the provision of documentation electronically. As SR 2022-225 and 2023-49 were not confirmed by the Assembly within 40 days, these rules cease to have effect and have fallen. Full detail and background is outlined, starting at page 771 of the meeting pack. So there's one briefing note covering all three rules at page 73 of the meeting pack. Before I uh, put any question, I will ask members for comments. I believe Paul Frew wants to Yeah, thank you, Chair. <coughs> uh, I have a, we have a problem with this. Uh, start rule simply because our party opposed the extensions to the Coronavirus Act 2020. We believe that this should have fallen and we believe that we should no longer be under uh, the law of Coronavirus Act 2020. Now that's not to say that this provision isn't common sense and that's not to say this provision is actually good for our people. But what I haven't heard yet from the department is whether it, it plans to continue this. 
We have an issue with regards to the Coronavirus Act 2020 being uh, temporary and needing to be extended every six months. So it's a road to no town to keep using this vehicle. So if the department is minded to keep this going because it's a good idea with regards to the registration of, of, of uh, deaths and stillbirths, then let's hear it. But if that is the case, then let them bring a suitable legislative fake of bespoke legislation that can go before the Assembly and be passed in good time or even by accelerated passage. Because the danger is this, the executive may not extend the Coronavirus Act 2020 in March. And where will the department be then? So if this is a good idea, if this is something that's the department are minded to carry on forever and a day, then let them bring their own bespoke piece of legislation and let them bring it through accelerated passage if need be. The thing is this, if this has been in operation for the last three, four years, and it's proven to have worked, there should be no danger then or risk of them bringing accelerated passage in the next month before the end of March to allow this to stand alone in its own legislative space. So on that, in that regard, Chair, I will oppose um, these three SRs, especially the one that is currently live. I ask for any other comments for members. Right, just, just a clarification to yourself or the clerk. So, um, as of now, the, the legislation removes the requirement to have an inquest um, in the death from coronavirus. Um, if, as I understand it, I'm happy to be corrected. Uh, or other notifiable diseases, and the continuation of this SR, if we support it, will or will it um, continue the um, that situation? Um, so will that mean therefore families won't be entitled to uh, an inquest if there's a death um, by coronavirus or stillbirth? Uh, if I picked that up correctly, or yeah, be the assumption. That would be my yeah, assumption. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I think that seems like a plain reading of it. Um, are there any other views on uh, this one? Conscious to get the good people. Yeah, yeah. Just, I mean, notwithstanding, I can understand the concerns yeah. being raised in terms of proper procedures and obviously some of these came in in, yep. in different times um i would be concerned though just to stop or not allow this to go through and the impact that that would have um you know because particularly pressure on gps at the moment and yeah. some of these procedures have been working notwithstanding that maybe in future it can go through the normal legislative route mm. um but it's just doing that now with some of the legacy srs that we're dealing with um so again, it's just to get an indication of implications of not going ahead, because I would be happy to progress. I'm not sure in terms of others um, if it needs to go to a vote. But if we weren't to do that, what the implications potentially could be. Yes, OK, that, that makes sense. Um, sorry, through the chair, just a suggestion. Could we write to the department asking them to A, come and brief us why we still have to uh, have this SR? But more importantly, can they bring legislation forward to to deal with this issue? Because if this is a just something that's followed up from Corona and it needs tidying up, yeah. well, why can't they bring it to tidy it up? Can, can I suggest, in the first instance, I, um, unless the clerk is a particular, but I, I was, what I was going to suggest was that we write to the department for a more detailed briefing, which we can then discuss, and we then, may then, at that point, uh, wish to put the question. Um, but we will get more information to, to, because I think there are legitimate questions. There are also legitimate points that have been made about um, the, you know, the, that there are practical, basically, what could be um, unwanted practical consequences for a, a procedures and practices that are working for health services under pressure. Can I suggest, Clark, that we, I think it's not unreasonable for us to write to the department and get its view on, um, on whether this is working as it is? And why they're on their rationale for extending it, and their view on why alternatives may or may not be advisable, and we can then, once we have that response, we can then discuss it a little bit in 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 a future, either ideally quite quick if we could have it relatively quickly. I'm going to try and do that through that readout as well, see if we can get okay. it turned around fast. Are there any other comments? Just for the future. Okay. I think at one stage another speaker wrote to us about this <clears throat> when it was one of the things that the Secretary of State was asked to work on. Decisions, as in, do you mean one of the decisions. one of the things that was in decisions made by the decisions session. had been made, and there was an expert mandatory it, note it on may it. Have been, but, but that can be covered was, in our brief. But there was something that said, I, I'm just 
trying to think from my memory here, there was something specifically in it that said that it was to be time limited, and uh, you know, not that I would normally agree with my friend beside me, but uh, uh, it does yeah. seem to be. Um, I think we probably need to be explained to the committee. It's, it's now getting lazy. They, they had two years before this place fell where they could have brought bespoke legislation if this was a good idea, and they failed to do that. Okay. I know that member has very strong and, and sincerely held views on that, but I'll we'll share that if we. Yeah, and just an urgency around this yes, because indeed. we're going to be busy enough going forward yeah. and making so sure we can so deal we can with as much of the legacy stuff as we can. We, we will get. I think it's important the members have the opportunity to, to raise questions and to do it generally. Yeah, we but we also it to do one do. side then, chair. We okay. get as fast a turnaround on yes. that as we possibly can. Okay. Um, um, so we will. Uh, I won't put the question today, but we will get a further briefing. Uh, when I say further briefing, I mean correspondence, and we will deal with it promptly. That's 22, 23, 24. This yes. is 20, those three agenda 22, items, 22, 22, 23, 24, yeah. yeah. Well, well, to be fair, 22 and 23 is gone. It's well, gone. I, I, but, but, but I mean, for the sake of completion, yeah, yeah. Sure. you can, you know, you, you're obviously, you obviously want us to get full, uh, full background on the committee, on the department position. Okay, moving on to agenda item 25, and hopefully trying to get to our keeping close enough to our timing. Agenda item 25 is... Um, uh, a, 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 obviously another SR, it is the um, uh, small business, uh, it's the uh, SR 295-2022 small business heredit hereditament, hereditament? Hereditament. New, yeah. one, new one for me, it's relief amendment number. number two regulations through the 2022. Departments made a statute rule which provide rate relief in respect of eligible small business hereditaments uh, to 31st March 2024. It provides relief of uh, 50 to 20 percent for businesses depending on rateable values where the NAV is less than 15k. Full details can be found at page 791. The rule is subject to negative resolution, came into effect on the 8th of December 2022. So just bear in mind, everyone, we are being asked to approve uh, a secondary legislation which will run out in uh, just over a month's time. Yeah. So, so um, our members are content with the statutory rule. Great. I'll put the question that the Committee of Finance has considered. S oh, sorry, Chair. Sure. I'm agreed to agree on agreeing it, but um, I noticed that the previous Finance Committee, I think you were on, yes. um, tried to get some information from the Department on the review, and I guess we're unsuccessful. Okay. Seeing we're a new committee, can we okay. uh, try again? Well, we might add that because we, we, because given we're doing the rate sort, the, the question of the rate sort, there might be a variety of rates related questions that we can ask the department. We, and we'll get a briefing. Yeah, because we, we have a briefing in we next can flag. week and that might be a useful opportunity to ask some questions. We question. can flag them, we can ask that question. Right, thanks. Uh, so, that the Committee for Finance has considered SR 295 2022 rates, small business hereditament relief uh, amendment number two, regulations rather than 2022, and subject to the report of the examiner statute rules, has no objection to the rules. Agreed. So, uh, so agenda tw item 26 is the rates making and levying of different regulations, uh, Northern Ireland uh, 2023, uh, that is uh, SR 2023-1. The department has made a rule to update the optional conversion factors uh, as a consequence of the 2023 revaluation of non-domestic rating that comes into operation on 1st of April 2023, that comes into operation 1st of April, this is what, this is what we're doing, it's obviously uh, a year, nearly a year ago, or that came into um, operation. All of the optional conversion factors appear to be at least 1% lower. Full detail and background to the rule can be found in the meeting pack starting at page 798. The rule is subject to negative resolution assembly procedure and came into operation on 1st of February 2023. Are members content with the statutory rule? Bear in mind, these are all questions that people can, can ask again. Just so, to, yes. To the chair, to Why is it conversion factors appear to be 1% lower? Uh, technical question. It's a technical question. I don't know the answer to, Steve, but the rates officials are here. I'm, I'm sorry, again, sorry, the law for apologies to the chair, but I think, I, mean, we went, I think the last time we went through all this rhetoric and we were t discussing it, and there was... It, <coughs> Yeah, it sounded quite dry to begin with, but then when we started digging into it, there was a bit more to it. Maybe just, I'm not going to stop it, but just why does it appear to be 1% lower when it should be going the opposite direction? And that, those are good questions, uh, Steve, which I think we can ask of the, the, the officials who will give you a better answer than I will. Um, so if members are content with the statutory rule, I will put the question that the Committee for Finance has considered SR 2023 won the rates making making and levying of different rates regulations in Northern Ireland 2023 and subject to the report of the examiner of statutory rules has no objection to the rule. Okay, agenda item 27, SR, the rate relief amendments regulations Northern Ireland 2023. Um, the Department has made a rule to update rates relief regulations in line with the statutory rule which is due to be considered by the Communities Committee. The rule appears to have a number of technical aspects aiming to ensure that the rate relief scheme remains compatible with universal credit. Given the complexity of the subject, 
members may, may wish to rece- request a briefing from departmental officials or the, is the, the same officials might be able to... Well, we actually have things. already arranged that if Member okay. Shekinteni is coming next week, good. we can do that okay. one as well. That's good. Okay. So, uh, yes, we will get that briefing next week's meeting. Okay. Now, uh, we're, we're nearly there through the SRs, then the actual um, uh, work begins, or I can rest my lax. Uh, agenda item 28 is SR 198 slash 2023, the rates localised flooding, emergency relief regulations Northern Ireland 2023, uh, and agenda item 29, which is the SR, which is SR 199 slash 2023, the rates localised flooding, number two, emergency relief Northern Ireland regulations Northern Ireland 2023. The department has made two related statutory rules to provide for emergency rate relief in respect of arrendments, which are specified by a district council in order to provide support to businesses as a result of severe localised flooding in uh, severe localised uh, flooding that occurred between 29th of October 2023 and 18th of November 23. They remove any rates liability associated with the affected premises and the other premises if the business has had to relocate. Full details can be found in the meeting pack starting at page 819. Now, if anybody has any comments on these, obviously I would simply acknowledge that this was a hugely um, uh, serious issue, particularly for people in South Down around uh, Don Patrick and Uri. So, um, uh, but um, if there are no comments, these rules are subject to negative resolution procedure and came into effect uh, in, on the 11th of December last year, 2023. So members are content with statutory rule. We will um, uh, put the question that the Committee for Finance has committed, uh, considered SR 2023, the uh, rates, uh, localised flooding emergency relief regulations Northern Ireland 2023, and subject to the report of uh, the examiner of statutory rules, there's no objection to the rule. And that the Committee for Finance has considered SR 2023-199, rates, localised flooding, number two, emergency relief regulations Northern Ireland 2023, subject to the report of the examiner of statutory rules, has no objection to the rule. Now, agenda item 30 is the rates, is SR 1 slash 2024, the rates small business hereditary relief amendment regulations through the round 2024. Uh, and members, this statutory rule will extend a small business rate relief scheme, which was first introduced in April 2010 for, uh, 20, for financial year 24-25, which obviously starts in a month and a half, uh, rating year. So this one is, shock hard, this is actually a forward looking, yeah. for anybody who's paying attention, this one is actually a forward looking piece of secondary legislation rather than one that we are catching up on. Um, the rule is subject to negative resolution, came into operation, I wasn't completely right, came into operation on 31st of January 2024, um, but, 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 but it's still yeah. live. Uh, full details can be found in the meeting pack starting at page 836. Um, are members, are there any comments first of all? If members are content, obviously we'll be able to talk about all these rates issues yeah. in the weeks to come because we'll have a, a briefing. Uh, if members are content with the statutory rule and if uh, the committee is content, um, we will. I will read the rule, which is that the Committee for Finance has considered SR 1 slash 2024, the rates, small business, hereditament relief, amendment regulations, Northern Ireland 2024, and has no objection to the rule. Agreed. 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 Agenda item 31 mm-hmm. is SR, two, is the last one, agenda item, t- which is SR uh, 2 2020 slash 2024, the new NAV list, time evaluation order, Northern Ireland 2024. Uh, members, this statutory rule operates as a technical mechanism to set 1st of April 2024 as the time Damn. that net annual values are to be ascertained for the new rating valuation of non-domestic properties. provides a legislative basis for gathering information. This is what this is. It's basically saying 1st of April is uh, the, the valuation date. Uh, rule subject to net negative resolution came into operation on 31st of January. Full details can be found in the meeting pack um, at page 843. If members are content with the statutory rule, um, I'll put the question. Uh, that just, sure, just... Um, yes. Uh, just before this one, um, I'm not going to stop it, but obviously the, uh, the revaluation date of the NIV list is something that's been uh, of considerable interest yeah. across the board, uh, virtually everywhere. So I just members of the members of the committee need to be aware that there's, this is it's not a dry piece of legislation, this one. This was actually quite important because it's going to set the sort of the overall rates level, particularly because we haven't revalued for a considerable period of time. Mm-hmm. So using the setting that date is going to be <coughs> critical. So maybe in our briefings um, and LPS will be coming to us. I imagine. LPS are up on the 28th, so not next week but the week after, but next week we've got um, 
we've got a briefing on the regional rate and the rates relief around universal credit. Plus, to be honest, anything else you want to roll into that one? Yeah, just just, just, we've got just, just about the re- revaluation. Right. Yeah. When are we likely to do a proper reval? Because that's been under discussion. The, the, the non-domestic is rolling. The domestic hasn't been revalued. There's been no revaluation since 20, 2007 because there's nothing in legislation. So the, the non-domestic, that's a three-year yeah. rolling review. There's nothing on um, on domestic. So I did ask this question when I, when I was... Yeah. Briefing the chief or briefing with the chief executive to start an exercise relatively soon and complete for non for domestic. You're probably talking 2028. Yeah, but that's not to say counter shouldn't be done. It's just there's no legislative time frame for it. So that's something the committee. Can well, first of all, do, do you think one? I'd remind members that we're going to have lots of opportunities, yeah. including possibly tangentially today, to talk about rates. There's also, a, uh, I think, a consultation which closed this week at some point about yeah. technical parts of the rates yeah. rating system. I'm sure everyone's mm-hmm. parties and researchers got uh, mm-hmm. very uh, fulsome responses into those consultations. Um, so this is obviously going to be something we discuss um, going forward. Um, if, but if people are otherwise content with the statutory rule, uh, I will put the question um, uh, that the Committee for Finance has considered SR 1-2024 the new NAV list time evaluation order in Northern Ireland 2024 and has no objection to the rule. Good, okay. Great. And that's just uh, the SR is done with. So well done everyone for getting through them. Now, uh, so can I get agreement that Hansard, who are um, already here, already here, thank you very much, Hansard, will record, uh, report and record the next item, which is a uh, first day brief from the Department of Finance. Great. Yes, great. Thank you. Great. Now, agenda item 32 is the first day brief from the Department of Finance. Um, members, can I draw your attention to um, the uh, first day brief itself, which was helpfully provided, and I should say provided very speedily. And um, This was the first committee to get it. Very first committee to get it. Uh, so thank you. So um, they, they provided, and it is at page 852 of the meeting pack, setting out the background. Um, to the uh, to today's meeting, as well as information which will be useful for new committee members on the remit structure and functions of the department, and identifying the key issues that it raises. Now, members, there is a briefing note at page uh, 849 uh, of the meeting pack uh, to, to guide you through today's hearing. Um, we have, I am delighted to say, um, in front of us, Permanent Secretary Neil Gibson, who has waited a very long time to give evidence in front of the Assembly. Uh, welcome, Neil. <laughs> Uh, in addition to which, uh, we have two directors from uh, the department, uh, Tony Simpson, hi, hello Tony, and also Joanne McBurney, who is no stranger to the Finance um, Committee. Uh, I should say Joanne is Director of the Public Spending Directorate, Tony is uh, Director of Strategic Policy and Reform. Um, I'm going to ask, first of all, I read, I don't know if you were in the room at the start, thank you very much for promptly providing first day brief and for corresponding with the clerk. Um, on and, and being here, and what's a very, very busy week for you. Um, uh, before we get into questions, um, Neil, can I ask you to give us uh, an opening statement? Uh, certainly. Uh, thank you, Chair, Deputy Chair, Members. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. As, as you said, Matthew, I've waited some time uh, to get this opportunity, so it's great to be here and, and very much look forward to working with uh, all of you uh, on the committee. Um, For some of you, you'll have been uh, very much involved um, with our finance briefings during the period without an executive, and I hope you'll have felt well informed and briefed in that um, period. We will hope to continue with that uh, full engagement with the committee and and, uh, answering any questions that you have today. Um, It's obviously an incredibly wide brief, the finance um, uh, portfolio, and you will have seen from the first day brief a lot of very detailed issues across a very broad uh, range of areas, and I can't do justice to those in any opening statement. But what I did want to say and put on record is, you know, my thanks to civil service colleagues, public service sector colleagues across the piece for the work over the last number of years in the period without an executive, and particularly from the permanent finance, uh, uh, permanent secretary, of the Department of Finance. Thanks to my senior colleagues who are here today, and indeed all the staff of the EOF for the work that they've done in the last two years. It's been a very challenging time. Uh, The world has been changing um, during that period, and that's brought all the pressures that I'm sure you're all very aware of and I'm sure we will discuss. 
So that's put a lot of pressure on, on the department and the services that it delivers to make sure other departments can function effectively alongside its role in central finance. Uh, we have managed, uh, and I hope this will um, uh, help us going forward, to manage very strong relationships across all departments and indeed with colleagues in NIO and in UKG in terms of um, the uh, conversations that have happened over the last two years. It's obviously very early in, in this new um, mandate and I think it's important to say that some of the decisions that we've had to take and some of the urgency with the matters that we are going to have to consider and indeed I'm sure we'll speak about today is not how we would hope that will um, operate in the future. Timing is working against us in order to get out um, uh, close out this year and then get into next year's budget. From a department's point of view, we continue to um, work on a number of strands of the sort of transformation journey that you would expect uh, the service to be going on, whether that is around the estate that we manage, the shared services that we provide, or the finance functions that we deliver. And I look forward to engaging with you all um, this afternoon on questions, and indeed over the coming weeks and months with all the officials. We tried to make the first day brief as, as um, uh, concise as we could about the most pressing issues. It doesn't do justice to the work of the department, and I'm sure we'll pick that up in questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Neil, for that. And, and before we get into questions, can I just put on the record, certainly uh, on myself as chair, I'm sure others would agree, uh, uh, like a tribute to the hard work of um, your officials who have had to deal with the uh, you know, political vacuum, but also all the... Um, all the vacuum that's flowed from that and the difficulty and the stress and indeed of course the stress of many of them not having a pay rise and you're responsible for that and of course we'll come on to that in substantive policy terms so um, that has not been easy to manage and um, we're going to go around and take some uh, questions I'm going to ask a couple of questions first but can I suggest um, if members are content if that works for you Neil that what we might do is that we have a concentrated series of questions on the financial package which I think is the most immediate thing that colleagues will be um, concerned about and after that we can um, we'll, we'll sort of fire a whole load of things we'll, we'll, we'll do it in order but if, if people are content with that we'll go around and we'll ask about the financial package first and then we'll have a second um, series of questions just I think to well because it'll probably be I think more structured and probably more useful for you so first of all Neil and others um, were you surprised by the contents of the letter from the Treasury? Uh, no, not surprised at the content in its overall structure. Much of that had been um, trailed in the, um, in the engagement that occurred particularly around the December period. But as always, there's a little bit you're still awaiting. We didn't get it until yesterday, uh, just before 11 o'clock. So there is a little bit of um, the particular language or how certain elements and areas of it were phrased. Uh, and as you will have seen, uh, the Minister has already written back quite swiftly on some of the areas that cause, um, uh, cause her greatest concern. So as always in these things, there's a little bit more in the detail when you see it, but certainly in terms of the overall components of that package, there was a lot of that that um, was very familiar from the material that was provided in December. There's a little bit of what appears, it may be disagreement or it may be a difference of interpretation, but the letter which went from the executive to, or the executive parties, or the executive I should say rather, to or First and Deputy First Minister, I'm not sure which, and you may be able to clarify, um, on the 5th of February, talks about a officials, officials commencing the process of developing a sustainability plan. This is under the heading sustainability plan. It says, which will include a focus on a productivity plan, long-term budget planning, then additional funding, brackets, <coughs> revenue raising, and other sources. But there does seem to be a bit of a disagreement among executive ministers about whether they had committed to revenue raising as part of this package. You were, but yourselves were in the room at Hillsborough before Christmas. Was revenue raising agreed to as part of the package uh, between the prospective then executive and the UK government? Uh, certainly in those conversations, revenue raising was always mentioned as one aspect of the conversation. The uh, reference to a sustainability plan was obviously a big piece of that. And um, uh, as Minister has already written, the expectation there was that um, any conversation in relation to how Northern Ireland's funding would, or finances could be put in a sustainable footing would require consideration of all matters of money coming in from whatever source and decisions that were taken. It's only in the detail of the letter that that's spelt out as a revenue raising component and then a separate mention to the sustainability plan. But the, but the letter that went from the executive before 
the, so the, the letter went for the 5th of February and then the letter came back from the Treasury yesterday. So that's an eight-day gap. The, me, the letter went from the executive does mention revenue raising. So is that where ministers agreed that a work programme would begin on revenue raising before yesterday's, um, to, to, simply because it's, it does say in the letter that officials will commence the process of, and then, you know, including a process of developing a sustainability plan, which will include additional funding brackets, revenue raising? Well, obviously, can't, uh, it would be for ministers to answer how they interpreted it, but certainly the language that, that, that's set out there is in the context of a sustainability plan. And, of course, the, ex- the executive makes revenue decisions every year, be it rate setting, whatever it might be, and therefore any form of financial long-term look at Northern Ireland's finances would have to consider all sources of revenue that come to that, be that locally generated, be that coming through the UK grant. So that, you'll notice, it's also in the same uh, bullet as uh, other sources of income, which would potentially come from other sources outside, potentially, other yes. funding streams. Borrowing, things like yeah. that. So uh, just, just to be clear, at any point, have you or your officials been instructed by an, an executive minister, uh, or either directly or indirectly, to, to begin work on, on revenue raising, other than uh, uh, so far? Uh, no. No. Okay, that's useful. Now, just on the letter which was sent back from the minister to... Um, the Treasury, it doesn't, and this I personally was slightly surprised by this, it doesn't mention a new fiscal framework. The letter on the 5th of February does mention a fiscal framework, but the letter which went um, from the new minister to um, the Chief Secretary yesterday doesn't actually mention a f- the fiscal framework, so it doesn't get into the detail of Barnet or, or backdating Barnet. Is there a reason for that? Uh, largely expediency in terms of the timing in which that letter came in, the most immediate questions that Minister um, wanted to raise most specifically. The key part of that letter was to ask for an urgent meeting in which all matters would be considered and discussed, including the fiscal framework that's been laid out previously. But particular attention, as you can see, that letter went back very swiftly that day, conscious of the executive uh, papers being discussed tomorrow. So in order to try and get those um, in a position to issue uh, for the executive to consider, there are a couple of very important pressing points that needed to yes. be made, most specifically public sector pay and around uh, the revenue element. So it's not the it, it, this was is without prejudice to the executive taking a position on what fiscal framework it's asking or, or, it, or and the okay that's helpful to know. Um, just uh, so as a point of clarity, because and, and I, I, I just think it is important to get the sequencing right. The financial the the fifth of Make sure I'm getting it right, but the I, I, the fifth of February letter says the financial pa- so fair funding with the fiscal floor, on, on that paragraph starts the financial package states was there a financial package at that point or was it? I, I was, I'm just interested in finding out from the department's perspective when did a financial package exist? There was a paper that was presented before Christmas. At no point was that published, and I understand you were legitimately asking the Treasury to publish it. But on the 5th of February, it says here the financial package. So there appears to be this period where it's kind of Schrodinger's financial package. Everyone seems to be aware of something and it's being called the financial package, but nothing has come from the Treasury. So at what date was the financial package agreed from your perspective? Um, our only confirmation of the figures in any detail was provided yesterday at just before 11 o'clock. That's when we got the official confirmation from the CST. As you rightly point out, many numbers were discussed and raised in, in, in discussions in December, and we certainly had working assumptions there about, but no, until that letter arrived yesterday, there was nothing. And indeed, that's the reason why uh, the executive papers only came when they did last night, was we were still awaiting that formal clarification of what the, the package uh, contained. I'm going to move on to that others now, but do you think it would have been better to have... Uh, from your perspective as, as officials, would it have been better to have this written down earlier? I'm not asking you to make a judgment about the politics of when or if an executive reformed, but would it have been better to have had this sort of nailed down a bit earlier? It's difficult to answer that in a way because obviously it's a political negotiation about what goes into that, so we can only react to what we're given when we're given. And I, I, you know, we're all aware from what's been um, statements that ministers have made 
about the amount of issues that were being pressed and debated and discussed in those meetings. So in, in one sense, of course, it's always good to have as much time as you can, but recognising it's a political negotiation and therefore items are changing all the time, we certainly did all we could to press at official level for any clarity on any of the items that were already being uh, mentioned. I've just got one final question, then I'm going to bring Vice Chair and let others go. Your presumably first item of agenda, first item of business with this new package is sorting out public sector pay. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have a um, sense of when you are going to be able to, or a target date for you, when you're going to be able to um, strike that deal, certainly for the, the negotiations you are directly responsible for? Uh, well, the, the Minister has put um, executive papers for discussion tomorrow, so it wouldn't be appropriate for me to talk about that, but that once that conversation is, is complete, we'll be able to provide you more information on that. Thank you. We're going to go to the Vice Chair, Diane, for side first. Okay, thanks, and thanks, Mr Gibson and officials, for being here today. Um, I just want to ask, in relation to the letter coming through um, regarding the, the funding um, set up for Northern Ireland, so um, our, our party colleagues said... Uh, Predominantly, our deputy leader Gavin Robinson um, has been speaking a lot about this over the past year and addressing the need to change the funding model for Northern Ireland. So it's good to see this being addressed coming through. But I just want to ask you, um, whenever this was coming through, which, did you have an expectation in the department that it would be um, backdated to the beginning of the comprehensive spending review? Um, certainly, uh, we provided um, data and analysis as to what uh, the implications of that would be, um, but there wasn't any expectation that that would be the case. Um, the important piece of the um, uh, evidence that we've been providing is what that implication has, what a different level of need has in terms of the overall financial position. And again, to follow on from the, what the Chair said, this wasn't explicitly um, mentioned in the Minister's letter. Would that be something that the Department would be following up again as we look at the model? Well, certainly baselining, as, as we might think of it in terms of a fiscal floor, in other words, ensuring that as, as, a, as, a, 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 as a devolved region, um, devolved administration, being certain that your funding available never falls below that level of need is certainly an important part of any conversation going forward about what a legitimate fiscal floor would be. Um, uh, in this particular example, there are one-off pots of money in this particular deal, uh, which if you add them in, then makes a different level of how much funding Northern Ireland has, but it still does not commit to any long-term level of um, uh, funding at any agreed fiscal floor. Now, there remains a debate about what a legitimate fiscal floor would be, but assuming that you had one, the acceptance within this um, uh, deal as it's been presented is a recognition of Northern Ireland's higher level of need. That precise level could be debated, but it still remains a possibility on the way that this deal is set out. In fact, as it's currently set out, it would be a, the case that Northern Ireland would slip below that level of need once the one-off package runs out. So ensuring that a proper level of fiscal floor is in place going forward um, and baselined in so that Northern Ireland doesn't fall below that uh, is, would obviously be something Minister would want to be engaging on on the conversation around a fiscal framework. Yeah, and to be clear on that, so um, is your understanding that the combined effect of being funded to the 124 definition plus the two financial years with the one-off payments, once we go beyond that, are we going to um, see a significant plunge for financial year 26-27? Yes, that would be the case. Um, and uh, if you like... Amplifying the challenge of that is because those are one-off pots of money, the ability to make long-term funding decisions um, that the executive would want to make is hampered by knowing that that pot of money will obviously end. So yes, without any other further top-ups, the data that we have available at the moment would suggest that at the end of those two years, Northern Ireland would then fall below a level of, of need as defined at 124, which as I say, is open for discussion. And just um, finally on that, on, in light of that, would it be the Department's view that perhaps revisiting um, the significant underfunding in the previous two years, going back to the beginning of the comprehensive spending review, could bring us forward to addressing the position of 23-24 going forward at the appropriate rate, might put us in a better position as we hit the 26-27 and beyond? Well, certainly within the deal, the figures that are provided for this year provide um, so funding towards that overspend from last year and, and from this year. Um, the question would be for a minister to decide the extent to which that um, would be a key component of, of, of the debate and discussion. But I think it's, it's definitely fair for me to say that we all, and, and, and we can all have experienced it, and I'm sure you will have through your constituents, you will have the experience 
of what it has been in the last two years and therefore there is um, a discussion to be had about what happens in an economy in which that funding falls below its level of need and that perhaps gives a little bit of an insight into what it could look like if that situation was to rise again. Thank you, Vice Chair. I mean, I'm sort of, I'll move on, but should we not put that in the letter? It just seems to me that we, if, we, if this is the core point that we need to backdate the 124, I would worry that some Treasury official reading that letter will say, well, you didn't put that in your mm-hmm. first, your first letter back, didn't even mention 124, so you're now asking us to concede this point, given we know that they aren't, as it were, not necessarily the Treasury officials, but certainly the Tory government to be trusted. There's a, a risk. Are you worried that there's a risk that they'd say, well, in your very first letter back, you didn't mention 124, let alone backdating it? Yeah, well, certainly a fiscal framework um, has been mentioned in the original letter. The first letter there, it, I think what's important to state is that the UKG have recognised and said that they're willing to engage on a fiscal framework conversation, and certainly at official level, and the, we've been very clear uh, that a uh, fiscal floor or the level of funding would be part of that conversation. So uh, whilst there may be an argument as to whether we should take anything as a given, um, a conversation about a fiscal framework can't not involve a conversation, in my view, about what a reasonable fiscal floor would be. Jerry Carroll. Thanks, Chair. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, just obviously there is raising additional revenues that Waiter to be it, but also in the in the letter from the Treasury. I mean, I have a concern that it's a one-way street, that you know, the only measures considered are suggested are water charges, tuition fees, or other forms of pain for working class people. Uh, corporate taxes are record levels here and they're never <coughs> rarely discussed about tackling. So maybe come on to that in a, in a wider question. But um, Neil, you were at some or all of these discussions or, or many of them uh, in terms of forming the government and the financial package. Um, did parties make it clear they were fo- opposed to the forms of uh, revenue raising measures, the likes of water charges, prescription charges? Was that made robustly clear to the British government that the parties were against it, or was it vague, or was there much challenge at all to those suggested ideas? Um, well, certainly in any of the conversations or meetings I was in, there was very clear um, uh, positions made about uh, a recognition of the conversation that needs to take place about long-term financial sustainability, and we've mentioned fiscal floors and other aspects of that, uh, but certainly in the meetings, and I certainly wasn't in all of them, uh, there were very strong positions made about cost of living impacts and what um, situation households and businesses find themselves in at this point in time. I appreciate it's a very diplomatic answer, but there was no opposition raised to those measures? or was there... there was a very strong, I mean, again, this is really a somewhat personal reflection on those conversations. There was a very robust debate about what sustainability looks like, what is a fair funding arrangement, what is fair, um, what is a reasonable, a lot of debates about levels of fiscal floors, etc. And in that sustainability conversation, there was obviously a perspective strongly made by UKG and by Treasury officials about what they expect from a sustainability point of view. And there were very robust um, evidence put back as well by all parties about what they felt were the important components. And hence, uh, that important piece from the first letter on the 5th of Feb from FMDFM to say, or from the executive, sorry, to say what components would be in a sustainability plan, which is not, uh, you know, one only one part of the jigsaw, it's the whole piece. I would like to, uh, was there any suggestion in the meetings you were in, again, you worked in all the meetings, I appreciate, and you're not here to speak on behalf of parties, but you were there, and I think it's important to get some clarity, was there any suggestion about increasing corporate region tax, or was it um, in the DUP Tory uh, agreement, um, the full name escapes me at this moment in time, but there was a a um, agreement to devolve uh, corporation tax, uh, presumably for parties to reduce it. Was there any conversation to increase corporation tax that you were part of? Um, I mean, I have to respect the, the conversations that took place and the, the political negotiations. It would not be for me to repeat all the conversations that took place in those, uh, but not in any meeting that I was in. Yeah. I think it's fair enough to say there are obviously limitations to what um, civil servants will um, want to disclose or are able to disclose, but um, I appreciate the Prime Secretary being as fulsome as possible. Um, Nicola Brogan. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Neil, and your colleagues today for attending here this afternoon. It's good to see you here in our first committee meeting. Um, I suppose, for me, it's very clear that the package is £3.3 billion isn't going to cut it, and I suppose actually all parties agreed to that there in the motion last week that was in the Assembly calling for the British Government to step up and put us on a more sustainable foot moving forward. And I suppose in previous roles as well, like I worked very closely with the Education Committee and the Department in the absence of the Assembly um, in the last couple of years. And I saw there firsthand how kind of devastated, devastating the, the underfunding 
that we've received for the North has on the um, services, public services for through education. So like the pathway funding, um, well Mark Brown actually had a step up and like ensure he got funds for that somewhere. But like Healthy Happy Minds and things like that there were all <coughs> scrapped and had real impact on families. And I know like services right across the board when it comes to health and infrastructure is all badly affected. So can you give me some kind of insight into the impact you, you think that the underfunded the British government have actually acknowledged um, the historic underfunding of the North, the impact that's had on services? Um, I don't think it would be fair for me to comment on because uh, in detail on, on the impact across different areas because it would always be a question of what I left out. Um, what I can say from from Department of Finance perspective is that as we see from the outturn data, the figures that come in, I could take you through every department and reflect on a level of pressure that that department is facing and each and every one of those has an impact on citizens, business, communities. So the examples you gave are just some of many that we're seeing right across the, the system and the piece. And it, again, if I might reflect as well, in some of the conversations that I've been involved in, um, in the absence of ministers, uh, this is not a uniquely Northern Ireland problem, certainly listening to colleagues in other um, devolved regions, uh, very much facing very similar challenges in terms of public service delivery in the current climate. So. You gave some very powerful examples. There are many more across all departments that could be provided. Yeah, it was clear to see, as you say, all departments have been really um, attacked by that there. And unfortunately, it was for us to pick up the pieces now. But, um, you know, as I say, the British government have publicly acknowledged that they have been underfunding the North for, for many years now. And I suppose that's been 13 years of their policy of austerity. Um, but. Can you tell me how the department has conducted, or have they conducted any analysis and what our true level of need is um, over recent years, or is there any plans to, in, in doing that there moving forward? Uh, I can't speak for all other departments. Certainly in terms of an overall assessment of need, uh, the work that was done by the Fiscal Council, um, Tony may wish to speak to, has um, set out some of the ranges of where you might measure that. It, it's quite a difficult science in many ways, because um, need in itself is, is, is a term that's quite difficult to defend. In one way, the way that we think of it, or the fiscal floor that you've heard narrative around, is in order to provide a similar level of services to what's being provided in, in the UK. There are discussions about whether that is the right level or not, so it's not, in a sense, a, a fulsome assessment of need if you think of it from the perspective of the individual or the community or how they're being affected. What you need as a level of public service is a slightly different question to what the level of need is when we think of it in a fiscal context. So there has been work done by the Fiscal Council, there's been work done from, from others. The predominant approach that's been used at the moment is try and replicate the wealth, Welsh methodology, excuse me, partly because that's already accepted and in, in place. Uh, but there are very clear reasons that a number of uh, parties and others have put forward as to why Northern Ireland might have a slightly different um, structure or nature that might mean that there are issues more specific um, to Northern Ireland that would affect that need cal um, um, calculation. So a fairly lengthy way of saying, can't speak for other departments, and even doing that aggregate type of calculation, it does leave a little bit of, you know, you're, you're simplifying a very complex issue, uh, but certainly those estimates pro provided by the Fiscal Council have been quite um, important um, in terms of providing some independent evidence around the picture. Tony, I don't know if that's a fair... Something. Yeah, yeah. the only thing I would add to that is obviously the Fiscal Council report provi provides obviously uh, a, 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 their main estimate of need at 124, but then provides a number of sensitivities which shows need uh, go, where it could be much higher. This is, this is highly subjective material. It's based on a small number of indicators and then it depends on the data you use and how how that aggregate, how it's aggregated. So the council report itself shows need could be uh, as has 129, depending on the use of a particular set of indicators. And then since that, the, the fiscal council provided their report. Obviously, there's been some discussions and parties have been involved in this in terms of other aspects of it, in terms of how you in particular factor in the additional costs associated with policing and justice here, where the fiscal council took uh, used one approach. But I think now there's. Uh, there's been some discussion which shows there's different approaches you could take, you could take the policing and justice. So there could be an aggregation of these different approaches to different aspects, which could justifiably suggest that need um, could be materially higher than that main estimate. Yeah, so those indicators are specific to the north, where, uh, where the stats now are focused similar, 
similarly to the Welsh model, but the likes that they're least in justice and even the living in a post conflict society yeah. and that they should be taken on board. Yes, there was no, and there was no basis in the Holton approach to to take account of that. So the 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 council had to do something unique for for Northern Ireland. But again, there's a range of different approaches that could be taken, and that's being recognised by the Fiscal Council. So that's you know an area that certainly, if there's a discussion on what the appropriate level of need for 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 the, for the region is, that we should be a key part of that debate. Okay. Okay, thank you, Matt. Thank okay. you, uh, Steve Aiken. Yeah, uh, yeah, just a couple of ones. Um, Hi, Joanne. I'm sure you're not getting away with that easy. Um, where are we on our budget position at the moment? Because I noticed that we're yet again we're uh, rushing away to do our sort of budget bill on Monday. So what's our how's how's the account today? <laughs> I'm, I'm delighted, Steve, that you knew where straight to go to for that particular <laughs> question. <laughs> there's a level, there's a limit to my knowledge, so do you want? So two two things. Obviously, the budget bill is being taken through in much faster time than we would ever have hoped. To do it, that is purely down to timing. Those of you who've been in the committee before would know we'd normally have introduced a bill by now. Um, so we can't wait, unfortunately, for decisions in the budget. We need to prepare that bill and get it through because there's a significant risk this year that departments will exhaust their cash limits in the first budget bill for 23-24. Um, usually we're safe enough to get royal assent sort of mid to end of March, but with the additional spending of departments their trajectory towards overspend, which was not obviously included in the budget bill at the start of the year because that was based on the Secretary of State's budget for 23-24, which we all know did not provide enough funding to departments. It has become clear that if we don't get a budget th bill through quickly, some departments may start to breach those cash limits. In early March, in fact, the Civil Service Pension Scheme is already there and has had to be given in advance for contingencies. Can I just suggest that we, we had agreed, and I think it's just that we go through the, the specifics of the financial package, and then we'll have time to come back afterwards and do things like budget bill. Mm -hmm. um, just if you know, I'm, I'm, I think it would be useful for us to focus on the financial package for now, I, what was what's been discussed with, and then we will have time to come back and do budget bill if that's okay. Now then, I'll see the other one. Well, what's happened to the consultation processes? Because I've just noticed on the media that the FM and DFM have just said that they've ruled out rate rises. So if we've ruled out rate rises, water rises, uh, tuition fee rises, if we ruled everything out, what was the point of doing a consultation process across the board as we said we were doing? Well, the consultations were requested, uh, directed by Secretary of State, and there was a lot of paperwork involved with different departments as to when they could launch those back and forwards. Some have launched, indeed. So I can speak to my own department. The Department of Finance one will conclude, concluded actually last night at midnight. Um, so... We will. We have officials looking at the responses. Close to 1,400 people or organisations did respond to that, uh, and certainly officials are looking for, through that information uh, as we speak. Some of the other consultations would be for individual departments as to what they do now, but um, that one concluded last night. Yeah. So just just a one tiny little sure. one. So we indulged in this consultation process to help inform the process for us getting through to the 1st of May, where we were going to go and sort of negotiate how we're going to do the sustainable build package and all the rest of it. And now we've taken large chunks of it off the table before we've even started. Um, well, I don't think it would be me for me to answer what what the, what ministers will want or what the executive sorry will want to include in their con, in their considerations for a sustainability package but certainly from the perspective of the department of finance we will have the information from the consultation to feed into that if required i think, to be, I think to be fair to executive ministers they didn't agree the consultation was, that there wasn't their direction now the contents of the letter in which they there is a commitment to explore revenue raising is a separate matter because that was signed off by executive ministers the, the nio directed consultations we're not their work, but that's fair enough. So uh, next is Paul Free, but we'll have a chance to come back to other issues afterwards. Thank you very much. Just on the question of need, which is very subjective, of course, uh, is, it, is it the need of a people of a certain region, or is it the need of the government departments of that region? Um, technically, in the way it's described, is it's considered as a measurement of the level of need to provide the equivalent level of public service in the comparator jurisdiction. So in that technical sense, it isn't really a need from the what my, an individual might think a person, an individual or a community might require. It's really a comparator of whether you've enough money to deliver the comparable level of services to, not to the comparator region, in this case UK. I think I heard you say that to Diane, the answer to Diane, that the, the 124, 24% needs-based factor is a temporary measure. 
Is that right? Did I hear that right? Uh, no, sorry, and apologies if I was unclear. The way the letter is formed is that that recognition of need then says that 124 would be applied to any future um, uh, Barna consequentials that come. The point I was making was that um, that's a level, that 124 is not a level that necessarily everyone would agree with. Mm -hmm. And, for example, it took Hotham himself quite some time to agree what the, the, the relevant metric and approach was. And we've already mentioned some of the areas in which Northern Ireland may be unique. So as to whether that would be a settled number or a true reflection, if you want to call it that, of, of objectively measured need, Tony's alluded to, there are other ways that you could measure it that might be different to that. But as the deal sets out, it commits to a 124 um uh, uplift, if you will, or factor to be applied to future barns. You mentioned 129 uh, earlier on. Does, does the does department have a settled view on that percentage? Uh, or no. is that a negotiation game? Uh, no, we don't. And indeed, that work was carried out by Fiscal Council to give some of those ranges, providing a level of independence. Uh, it would also be important to state that uh, there would be other perspectives too that maybe um, Treasury or UK would bring to the table to talk about other aspects, for example, treatment of agriculture, other matters that might also need to be considered that weren't in the Welsh assessment. So there is a quote-unquote body of work to be done if the exercise was to say, how would you independently assess? But that's not work that the department have done. In the letter, it, it, it's very clear on conditions, but it's not clear what conditions meet what criteria. And what I mean by that is... It states you mean the letter, Paul, from the Treasury the to Treasury, us? Sure, from the Treasury, yeah. It states that the, they, they will, they're willing to pause the repayment of reserve of a five five nine million. But is that only in the condition of the revenue raising of £113 million? Well, One of the reasons for the letter asking for an urgent meeting is partly to clarify some of those language points. Yeah. And whilst we could all speculate what we think some of that means, I think it's a fair assessment to say there are areas that we would want to, and indeed the Minister has, you know, didn't cover everything in her letter as to the things that she would want to discuss, but certainly some of the detail around that conditionality. You, the Department uh, issued a consultation on financial context for revenue raising in January 2024. Where are we with that with regards to revenue raising options? Uh, yeah, certainly the two consultations that our department um, uh, ran uh, are both uh, concluding, uh, one of them being on the rates options and the other one being on overall financial sustainability. And again, we'll have officials looking at those results they only concluded yesterday. Last question on this point, uh, Chair. It also mentions the long-term strategic inf infrastructure plan, which sounds really, really nice and something that we been, should have been doing years ago. It states in the letter from the Treasury that it's expected... Is that conditional uh, on, uh, on, on any package of money coming? Um, you only have the same letter as me and the word says expected. So there has been a lot of work ongoing on a capital programme and a sort of ISNI work that, that the SIB have been involved in. And I'm sure we'll be bringing that forward in due course. But um, I don't have any other insight as to what exactly expected means in that context. Hey, that's me, Chair. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Philip Brett. Thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you all for coming along. Um, have you had a reply to your letter yet? Uh, no, no I, I paused for a moment there because I thought it's been such a busy day. I don't want to say no in case I have missed it in the last hour or two, but not to the best of my knowledge. Of course, so, listen, I think we all realise that you know, this is a political negotiation between the, the executive and the UK government. Um, you know, they'll set out their lines, ministers will set out their lines, but when does it come to a crunch point that you need certainty on this So, in advance of setting a budget for next year? Uh, well, certainly in terms of the budget position for next year, it's important to have very urgent conversations about what that looks like so that the correct evidence can be presented to the executive for consideration. It, there, I would say, I think, and Joanne, correct me if I'm wrong, I think there would be sufficient clarity in that to allow us to conclude on the 23-24 position because there isn't, there's nothing in that as a variable or likely to move, if you will. So that allows us to, uh, and in fact, one of the decisions that, that, that was taken to present separate executive papers is for exactly that reason, that everything that we have that we're going to have for 23-4 to f close out this year, we now have enough detail on. But there still are a number of elements, most specifically the one you raised there, that still require a little bit of clarity to, to mean we've got the full picture for 24-25 budget setting. So at the moment, um, we're just in the sort of foothills of that process. We're trying this sort of ending, getting the 23-4 finished. Uh, but we have enough clarity for it 
but still a few items to, 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 to tighten up and hopefully that urgent meeting will help us to do that. And if what is your ideal date to, to close this out so you can then sort out 24, 25 and bring it forward then? Ideally, you'd like a budget in place for the 1st of April, but we have to recognise that ministers are only just in post, and I think it's important to give ministers time to consider their own departments and the pressures within that. So it'll be for the finance ministers and the executive to decide on the actual timescale for bringing forward a budget for 24-25. Some of that may depend on how quickly the Chief Secretary of the Treasury agrees to meet, but ultimately for the executive and the finance minister, but as soon as, po as, soon as possible. Can you just clarify, Joanne, you mean a budget rather than a budget bill? Because this is going to be that we have... We are, yes, everyone on this committee is going to have to explain to their colleagues that they're not the same thing. Yes. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> you were talking about an actual budget. I'm not talking about the actual budget where the executive sets out the funding allocations for each department for the incoming financial year. Okay. Owen Tennyson. The executive thank you, Chair, and, and thank you all for coming along, and thank you to the support that you provided um, during the two years when we didn't have an executive as well. It's really appreciated. Just coming back to Mr. Frew's point about the conditionality, <clears throat> does your department understand that there's been any change around the conditionality that you were informed of at the conclusion of the process in December and now, or areas which were previously clear which are now unclear following the Treasury's letter? Uh, no, I wouldn't say anything's been made less clear, but actually, though the um, conversations in December and more subsequently, until yesterday's letter, there was no precision of language as to what actual you know, there was no precision as to what number would be acquired at what date. So it's only really as of 11 o'clock yesterday that we would have had the formal CST position and therefore have enough clarity on exactly what that means for budget setting. Okay. And the, the Minister's response makes reference to public sector pay and the desire that the, the financial package <coughs> and the totality of public sector pay demands. I know that UKG, UKG had access to um, the executive's figures effectively when the executive wasn't functioning. Can you speak to why there would be a differential between the, the number that's included in the package for public sector pay and the actual public sector pay expectation? Um, well, uh, yeah, I'll let you do um, You have to uh, sort of bear in mind that the figures that the Northern Ireland office were working off were figures that provide a three routine forecast outturn. Some of those figures actually included costs of pay awards that departments were planning. If you strip that out and take that out of the overspend and put it into pay, that increases the pay number. Also, they were at a point in time, they would have been figures based on outturn to the end of October, which were provided to the Northern Ireland office in November prior to the talks in December. We are now further through that process and things have been refined. So some movement in the numbers is absolutely to be expected at that point, and also, as I say, the stripping out of some of the pay awards from the outturn and putting it into the pay, where, where it correctly sits. Well, that's perfect. And just one final question, if you will, Chair. Um, originally, in the details of the package that were released by UK government, it had included, I think it was 15 million for the PSNI data breach. That, as far as I can see it, and I may have missed it, isn't referenced in the Treasury's letter. Do you have any insight as to whether that's oversight or whether that's intentional on the government, government's part? Definitely had Joanne more. <laughs> the funding was no longer required by the PSNI. The original um, reserve claims for items like the data breach are only for that financial year only, and obviously things move on. And ultimately, the, the PSNI only required six million in the 23-24 financial year, which could be funded. Um, you'll recall that the Treasury did agree a capital to resource switch. We could get a Barnet consequential on that for flooding and some of it for the PSNI data breach. It can all be covered within that funding, so it was no longer required. Therefore, it wasn't included. And there's no suggestion that they would roll that into next year. Reserve claims don't roll forward into a financial year. If, if a, a new pressure emerges next year, we would have to consider whether we went for another reserve claim at that point. Okay, thank you. Deirdre Hardy. Yeah, no, thanks very much um, just for coming along. And I suppose just to echo what others say, I mean, I think on the one hand, it's a nice distraction to focus on £113 million, pounds, which has been put out there the last couple of days, um, when you're looking at a, a much bigger package and what was talked about in terms of the Fiscal Council report of the historic underfunding that has been taking place here. Um, and I think it would be useful um, from this committee as well to send out a clear message to the British government that they urgently need to engage, the Treasury urgently needs to engage with the Finance Minister and indeed with the Executive as a whole um, on the fact that they themselves have publicly recognised through the Secretary of State to hear um, that we have been underfunded. I know the figure of 124% has been bandied. For me, that's a, a baseline. 
um, because as you say, looking at uh, certain indicators of need, um, and particularly pertaining to our own unique circumstance here that wouldn't be the same in England or Scotland or Wales, um, then I am keen to see where those conversations are going to go as part of this, because I think it will be important from this committee that we don't detach or look in isolation of one figure without looking at the overall budgetary situation um, as a whole um, and the fact that it has been publicly stated that we are historically underfunded. And I would be keen to get um, even a brief overview. I know we'll get into this as we get into the committee sessions themselves, but the impact that that fund underfunding has had on our public services here, I would be keen to know that. I know we can see it. Um, on a daily basis, but just to be keen to hear the officials' response um, in terms of that, because I know that that was in the conversations uh, previous to Christmas um, in terms of looking at the social and economic impacts of that historic underinvestment. So I would be keen um, to look at that, but also in the context of the 3.3 billion, there was obviously the work of the Fiscal Commission as well in terms of looking at additional powers and levers. So if we are going to look at a sustainability plan, um, of which, of course, revenue raising is a certain aspect, but again, you can't look at that in isolation of needs, of poverty and of other indicators as well. Um, I would be keen just to get an update in terms of uh, the Fiscal Commission itself in terms of those additional powers, uh, what conversations will be had then with the Treasury as part of that broader um, engagement from the Executive as well going forward. And indeed, also, just um, as we're moving through this process, I'll be keen to look in terms of the sustainability plan, in terms of engagement with staff themselves. And I think it's good um, if there are papers already gone to the executive um, around public sector pay and other issues. I think that's really positive and that's a good indication. But just obviously um, a keenness that staff, trade unions and others are going to be kept up to date and informed by the department as we move through um, all of this process as well. But I think, I mean, I'm not sure what way we could indicate from this committee, Chair, but if there could be, you know, um, a strong, resounding um, voice coming out, a collective voice of this committee today, that we call on the British government and indeed Treasury to urgently engage with the Minister and indeed the Executive on all of these issues um, without further delay, I think that would be good. Well, I actually have a proposal related to that in Chairperson's business, so we can talk about it then. Yeah, yeah well, I'll make that proposal too, yeah. Thank you. If any of the officials want to respond, um, only a little reflection on that point, which is two things that you mentioned. I think it's just worth, for me, just given the last two years reflecting on. I think it's worth just making a mention of of trade union colleagues. Um, it has been an incredibly difficult time, and certainly as uh, the, the the person with responsibility on on personnel matters, um, the way that they've <coughs> conducted themselves with in terms of their engagement with with us as officials and and through a very difficult time, is to them and to their members credit. To, to be fair, so industrial relations are incredibly strong, and I think that's a very good platform. And then the second reflection I wanted to make, um, uh, re respectfully, this job is very challenging, but it's dealing in spreadsheets and allocations of money. So a lot of that impact is felt within departments and you will hear a lot of that. So it's very important to stay very close to colleagues and, and, and to listen to the conversations in other departments because whilst we have a very challenging job dealing with the numbers, uh, you know, a lot of my colleagues and, and your colleagues and, other, and, and my colleagues in other departments are seeing that firsthand in the services. So th there is absolutely uh, a story to be told. It's whether a Department of Finance official is the best person to tell it. Any more No bother. Um, I mean, I suppose my, my, my final point is like, thank you for giving evidence, and I realise it's fast moving. Um, I suppose my only concern, I'm glad you've kind of confirmed in broad terms where we are. That's really helpful. Um, uh, we don't want to get hung up on the on the revenue raising picture, but clearly we do need to, to understand that um, that this has been in the ether, and it was as you've said, it was um, it was there. It wasn't. It didn't come out of a clear blue sky, uh, as 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 has been uh, depicted. But I also, I suppose, would just express the concern, in, before we move on to the next item, that there is a my slight worry would be that we now have a situation where we're kind of taking it a wee bit on trust that um, the current chief secretary of the treasury, Jeremy Trott, and uh, the Jeremy Hunt are going to engage politically on this. And I worry, given what we know about, and Deirdre uh, put it pretty punchily around the. Uh, the lack of seriousness about this place and the commitment to austerity rather than fair funding. 
It's not really in their political interests and it's not really going to be at the top of their agenda. So I would worry that this will now be taken forward by officials who might well, as Joanne discovers a lot, simply be in a kind of fairly computer says no territory in terms of negotiation. So I hope we haven't missed the actual window to, to, get, the, to get progress rather than um, uh, and, and, and allowed them to, to close this offer when we could have nailed it down. But I hope that's not the case. OK, um, thank you very much for that. Now, we've talked with Financial Banks for nearly an hour. I do want to give people the opportunity to talk about a whole range of broader things that are in the first day brief. There's loads in this department, and it's not just public spending. It is a whole range of other things. Um, uh, I have a couple of things, but in, in, in deference, because I asked quite a few questions to start last time, I'm going to go to people first. Um, the first person is the, um, is the deputy, is the, the vice chair, and then I'll go to Jerry Carroll after that, and obviously indicate to the clerk, should you wish to ask a question. Thanks very much. Um, I just wanted to ask at this point, um, you know, in February, what is the estimated pro projected overspend for the 23-24 year across the block? We are working through the latest returns from departments at this stage. It's it's circa 400 million, but there are some adjustments that may be made to that, and that will be something that the executive will wish to consider when finalising its 23-24 budget for each department. <coughs> And just um, underneath that, are there any departments looking at any underspends against any of their budget heads? And in terms of that, um, are, are we taking any action so that we aren't handing any money back to Treasury at the end of March? We have been liaising closely with departments on the latest forecast out turn returns. There are I think, a few very small levels of underspends and departments have been identifying those. So we are working through that and the uh, Finance Minister will bring a paper to your executive colleagues to set that final budget for 23-24, which will allocate the funding that's available in the financial package and set their final plan for the year. So uh, we are doing everything we can to manage that position very tightly. Thanks very much. I just think, and just to put it on record, I think that you know, in the current budget situation where we're looking at overspends and to see in a different header that we're handing any money back to Treasury at the end of this financial year, um, it's not an acceptable position. So anything that we can do with six weeks left. Can I just clarify, there are separate funding categories, and for some of them, such as student loans, <clears throat> that can only be spent on student loans impairments. It can't be spent for other pressures. So. We are managing our capital and resource Dell positions very, very tightly to avoid any overspends or underspends. On some of those areas which are ring-fenced for specific things, that might be unavoidable due to how we're funded, which is barn of consequentials of what happens in England and not reflecting different systems here. So it's, it's just to be conscious <coughs> we may see it in certain areas, but not hopefully in the resource or capital Dell. Oh, absolutely. The, the, thank you. Sir. Thank you. The, the 400 million is our Dell. Yes. And that would, just looking at the table from the Treasury letter, the four, that would eat up, I mean, unless I'm missing something, that would eat up sort of four-fifths of the stabilisation money for next year, were there not? As I said, it, it's circa 400 million so, and there are some decisions for the executive to take around that, so you can't just take one from the other. Um, well, there's a challenge. It's going to be it, a big, yeah. It, it is not an easy financial position for any department at this stage in the financial year. Indeed. Yeah, well put, to, uh, Jerry. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, three quick questions. Um, Neil or, or Joanne, whoever is appropriate. Um, the department has 169 agency staff. Um, why is it that figure? And is there any work to bring them um, full time staff into the department? Uh, agency staff is, um, well, there are a number of actions being taken place. We're doing a lot of reform in our HR services to um, speed up recruitment, etc. But there's often a case where we have a body of work that has a temporary um, period of time uh, allocated to it. And sometimes that's not always appropriate then um, to, to bring in full time staff. It's also worth reflecting on the increasing challenge of recruitment to the public service, uh, not just as a reflection of um, uh, uh, pay predominantly. But the Northern Ireland economy is growing, the, the employment rates are higher, the, the competition is, is much greater for labour. So it is becoming more and more difficult for a number of departments to fill, including in my own. Uh, we, we're often looking to fill um, posts and struggling to do so, unfortunately, given the relative competitiveness now of our offer, if you will. And well, that's connected with the pay, obviously, as well. But I think as a, as a rule, we should be moving away from reliance on agency staff and finance, respectively. And Health and across the board. Uh, but two other questions. Um, industrial fee rating uh, and the landlord allowance. Appreciate that maybe more of a LPS issue, but is that being uh, looked at by yourself and your team, uh, the department? Uh, PPPs and PFIs, I think, are under the department's remit as well. Given the scale, I think it's somewhere in the region of three to four hundred million pounds 
every year we're paying in PPP and PFIs. Um, I think there's a question of whether that's value for money. I don't think it is long term, but is the department um, looking at those issues? Um, and any updates on that would be useful. Thanks. Thank you. I'll come back. I don't have any detail on the, on the second point about uh, PPPs there. I'll, and I don't know whether that the Minister's intentions there. In terms of industrial rating, it would be more for LPS colleagues to speak about the detail of that, um, but certainly um, it was in the consultation one of the areas that was asked about. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Philip Brett. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to turn to your first day brief. So, decisions required within four weeks. So, we're almost two weeks into that. How's it going so far? <laughs> That's a good question, and again, I feel a little fatigued over the last two days, so it depends when you ask me, but um, but generally speaking, going very hopefully, and, and I hope um, uh, committee members will feel the first day brief was written in a way to try and be absolutely concise about what we absolutely <coughs> urgently needed to do. The uh, uh, Minister has, uh, has met and continues to meet with individuals to make sure we're progressing those matters that we do. And though I am very loath to say this on record, though it is incredibly difficult financial position, which we spend a lot of time talking about, due to the leadership of the people outlined in those business areas, I'm fairly confident that we're making progress against all of those four day week, four, um, initial four week tasks. Okay, so page 24, a great approach to pause Funding, including levelling up funding. Um, just wanted to check: is it the position now of the department that you want to pause those funding streams? We now have, as a result of the package, we now have more clarity on what um, monies were to be re available for the executive to reallocate as they see fit, including it could be back to the purposes that they were originally for. At the time when we were preparing that first day brief, we didn't have the clarity of what what would be in scope for that. We now do have that material. Okay, uh, just two other quick ones then. Uh, urgent decision on Enniskillen bypass. You'll see there's a debate on this issue in the Assembly on Monday uh, by the Chair of the Infrastructure Committee, my colleague Deborah Erskine. But your brief says that the Minister would need, need to take a decision on that within four weeks. So we're halfway through the period. Is the Minister nearly in a position to make a decision on that? Um, the Minister's brought forward an executive paper on that. The issue is, is tied into the removal of New Deal funding. It was previously to be funded from that. That funding has been removed. And there is a risk that if an urgent decision isn't made, the procurement process will not start, which will lead to more delays. And some of the funding has already been spent, being stopped. But it's a decision for the executive to make whether or not they wish to commit to funding to that. And hopefully that decision will be made soon. Perfect. And just finally, then, the Northern Ireland Civil Service pay offer. Um, obviously, I'm sure all of us as constituency MLAs are regularly contacted um, by constituency or civil servants and who are looking for their fair and equitable pay. So just wondering how those discussions are going. Again, executive paper tomorrow. Uh, as I said, um, the important point is that now with the, the detail of the package, we know exactly what is available for 23-4. And the Minister has been very clear in stating the importance of all public sector workers being considered, including <coughs> civil service workers, and not treating any group individually. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, Steve Aiken. Yeah, okay. Th thanks, Dave. Uh, so just a couple of ones. Um, first one, sort of 24-25 budget, when are we going out to consultation on it? Unfortunately, I don't think the matter for the Minister and the Executive, but I don't think the timescales are going to allow us to go out for consultation. Usually, as you know, we would set a budget in, in sort of September, October time, go out for a consultation, have a final budget December, January. We do need a budget as soon as possible into the new financial year to allow departments to plan effectively. That won't allow for the normal process, so we may have to do things slightly differently just to get a budget in place to allow departments to plan. There's more risks around not doing that. Departments will then be able to consult in slower time and do the proper EQIAs, which we can feed back to the executive at a later point. When are we going to start? To, well, you know, we've, we've gone through this process before time and time again, and we as a committee here have been asked time and time again to sort of sign off on stuff that just comes cascading out of the ether expecting to be given due diligence and the rest of it. When are we actually going to see some of the information coming through? 
Well, the executive has to agree. It, it's an approach to Budget 24-25, so my understanding is the Finance Minister will discuss that with her colleagues tomorrow, um, and then the committees will engage with their departments on the information they're providing to us. So in advance of those decisions being taken around timing, I can't give you explicit detail, but I imagine over the next few weeks, those departments should, departments should be engaging fully with their, co their committees on the research. you think it's going to be tough to do it before the first, you think it's going to be tough to do it before the start of the new financial year? I, I think it will be tough to do that, bearing in mind that ministers are just in post, and each yeah. minister will want to consider their own department's pressure. Information we have so far is based on permanent secretaries' view of things. Ministers may have different priorities. I just want to completely sort of change away from finance just for a second. Neil, um, we had lots and lots of discussions about sort of reforms that were going to be made by the Northern Ireland Civil Service after the RHI inquiry, and also things about the senior leadership of the Northern Ireland Civil Service and what they were going to do. And you've become the responsible owner of most of that. What's happening with that? Um, a couple of things I would say to that. It may be worth a conversation at a later date. Um, obviously, budget is dominated today about the progress that we've made. Uh, we um, are certainly, in, in my time, adopted an approach of both trying to have a strategy to reform, but also making um, positive steps and making small steps. And whilst it would be wrong of me, he says as he's about to do this, to pick out a few examples, but it, they may seem small, but little things like the fact that we're trying to accelerate our estate strategy to save money where we can. Uh, we in the Department of Finance are now sharing our building with DERA. Uh, that was done at an accelerated pace and is now in place. Um, we got the update to managing public money done, which was very significantly out of date, uh, to give you a better platform from which to discuss it, whether you want to look at it again, made it more in line with other guidelines elsewhere. And we've made a lot of um, uh, progress <laughs> on how we structure our HR and our well-being and our support services and learning and development. And I would very much encourage the committee to engage fully with Jill and with Catherine on some of those people uh, uh, areas. I would also say that we've unfortunately been in a very difficult financial position. So, so funding um, reform and transformation programmes has been a, a little bit challenging. You will see the um, reference to a transformation um, um, uh, body potentially within um, uh, going forward. At the moment, we don't have anything set up like that of that structure or funding. public service transformation? Yes. We don't, we don't have anything like that executive currently. executive agree to that? Is, it, is the executive's position that it agrees? That's to, to be discussed. The exec that is a part of the debate about what that would look like and how it would be shaped. There's no detail exactly on, on how that would look. And that may be a vehicle for taking force forward some more change, but we're certainly, and head of the civil service team, is pushing very hard on long-term people strategies and transformation agendas. So I think it is worth potentially thinking about a session on some of that reform and transformation journey, where I believe we've made progress with a limited budget, but we've also started to get a lot more feedback and spend a lot more time analysing what our staff tell us as well about the expectations they would have of the sort of changes they would like to see. So I feel we've made some progress, Steve, but um, a lot more to go, and perhaps this new... Uh, organisation or group, if it's set up effectively, will perhaps give that a little bit more uh, impetus. Any more space in the building to stuff anybody else on it? Could you so make it one brief? Because I want to get others in before we move on to. Um, I think that was a rhetorical comment. I'm sure to be noted by the officials. Uh, Owen Tennyson and then Paul Frew and then we'll try and. Thank you, Chair. And I suppose it's just <coughs> further to the previous discussion where we talked about the level of the fiscal floor, the different models in terms of accounting for police and justice, and also baseline in the fiscal floor akin to Wales. Looking to the next spending review, which is fast approaching, what is the department's strategy in terms of forcing a discussion on that issue with the UK government? And has any consideration been given so far to appointing an independent commission to make recommendations for consideration by government? Uh, it'd be for the minister to decide how to take that forward, but certainly uh, what you've outlined there would well be well within the scope of what a discussion about a fiscal framework might indeed involve. We all refer to Hotham. It was an individual piece of work to look at that particular area, so I think it's a very reasonable part of that conversation to consider whether Northern Ireland needs the same type of independent assessment of its need. And just final question, and Joanne, you outlined the, the issues around 24, 25 and timelines and everything else. <laughs> Is there an aspiration that beyond 24-25 we would try to return to a multi-year budget cycle at that stage? That has, all, that has been our aim for some time. We are tied to Treasury spending reviews periods, unfortunately, but yes, that's certainly something we would aim for, obviously subject to discussion with the Minister, but I would be surprised if the Minister didn't want to do that. Um, and I would just add to that a little bit on um, long-term planning. Um, we often think about what it takes to run our departments within the year ahead. 
uh, if we step back and take a helicopter view of philosophically what's happening now in terms of the cost of delivering services and the pace at which those costs are rising, looking <coughs> longer term is something I think will be incumbent on all of us. It, there's the specifics of a multi-year budget, but there's also looking at long term how you're going to provide public services in a changing world in which you know demographics are changing and demands of citizens are changing. I, I just know briefly, just in relation to his last question, the, the letter, point 22 of the letter from CST says the funding set out in this letter will not affect, affect baselines for the purposes of the next spending review. So we need to, that will need to be overcome, but obviously whether there's a, a CSR in election years to be... Okay, Paul. You uh, think you chair, we'll move I think you, you'll know this is a bugbear, mind you, Alan, we've spoken about it many times. Consultation aside, consultation aside with regards to the budget uh, for 24-25, for but how, why on earth would you ever set a budget without a fully priced programme for government in place to inform it? Well, you know, I'm, I'm happy to <laughs> <answer> you, <then>. <laughs> <laughs> I think as I've also said many times before, yes, that is absolutely what should happen. Unfortunately, sometimes time works against us in that, and departments do need budgets to enable them to spend money. And we can't have public services done, but you're absolutely right. I think I've said that before too. That's that's do definitely you, what should happen. Do you have any inkling or indication from other departments that they are working towards, or the executive as a whole is working towards a fully priced programme for government? I will turn to Mr. Gibson on that one. He may have been more involved in discussions than I. There, there, <laughs> Sorry. There, there are certainly and have been discussions about what the the bones of a Section 20 programme, the programme for government, would look like. But in terms of any detailed work around a cost of programme for government, uh, not that my department's involved in at this point in time. The way I look at this, Chair, is that whilst the budget is the fuel, the programme for government is the car, and the two cannot operate uh, aloof from each other. So to me, it's very, very critical that we would have a programme for government that's realistic going forward. And I know it's not your fault, I, I'm, I'm just venting here, but I do think that it's critical that this executive would have a fully priced programme for government in order that we spend money wisely. Uh, and it goes back to my point about need. Is it the need of the people or is it the need of the department? I'll leave it there, Chair. Thank you. Here we are. It was just on the, the last point around multi-annual funding, I mean, I think they were almost there in the last executive and then things came down. So um, I would be keen, I'm sure the committee would, to get back to that point um, as soon as, as practically possible. And I think it is just to highlight it's not just in terms of public services and, and public sector workers, but we know for certain sectors like childcare, community and voluntary sectors are now hitting a crisis point in terms of recruitment and retention of staff. Um, and people who are working within each of those sectors and I suppose trying to attract new talent. Um, so again, it's just taking a rounded view, you know, and to make sure um, that the department um, and all of the departments are looking at these critical issues in terms of how their funding impacts on society more broadly as well, and particularly around recruitment and retention um, within those wider sectors, um, which often support um, government in terms of programme for government and key strategies. So. It is just one to point out because I even see on the ground it's hitting a crisis point um, in some of those sectors at the minute. Thank you. And I mean, I would just um, I have a, I do have a final question or two before we uh, wrap this up. And thank you for your forbearance. But given we are going to be asked, your department is going to ask us in the coming days to grant accelerate. We expect to grant accelerated passage for a budget bill. Um, I have to ask you why. The timing. Quite simply, the timing. Um, if I'm completely honest, we have been pushing the Northern Ireland office since before Christmas that a budget bill needed to be taken through as a matter of urgency if departments were not to run out of funding, particularly out of, out of cash, I should say. Um, you can understand why the Northern Ireland office was reluctant to take a budget bill through Westminster when it looked like the executive was coming back, and it's great that that has happened, but it leaves us in the position of we need to get royal assent on an updated budget bill, which includes the funding in this financial package before departments exhaust their cash limits. And as I mentioned, Mr. Aiken earlier, those cash limits are set very low at the moment because they're set on the budget that was set by the, by the Secretary of State back in, in, at the end of April. It doesn't include any of the funding in this financial package. So departments that are on an overspend trajectory are also on a trajectory to exhaust their cash limits. And that is happening quicker than it would in any other year for that reason. Usually we have until the end of March before that happens. This year, not only are we later bringing a budget bill forward, but when those departments start to exhaust those cash limits will be much sooner. Um, 
we already have the civil service pension scheme has already exhausted its cash limit and had to be granted an advance from the consolidated fund for contingencies but we're limited in the amount that we can do for that and that is why we're rushing it through it is not something that any of us would have wanted to do and i hope we're not in this position again and we can get back to normal processes I would say we know it is a big ask of the committee, and if there's any additional information or briefings you would want, we will do our best to facilitate that to, to help you reach the. To Just to work it through, are there, are there any? Um, you, you mentioned uh, the pensions breaching; it's uh, a claim having been made in the consolidated fund already. Um, what happens, and by what date? If this, I mean, just to get on the record your the, the department's position. I mean, will, will it be as? Is it your view that it's or I mean. Is it that literally salaries won't hit pay packets, or that lights will go off? And so, I mean, is it, or, and should we be, should I be as indulgent, or should we push back and say, is it really that bad? Could we wait a couple of weeks extra just to do the, just so people, the public out there, don't think they're straight back in, and then they're just waving the budget through without even just out of it. In my own honest opinion, we can't afford to wait any couple of weeks. If, if we could have afforded to wait a few weeks, I wouldn't have put my team under the pressure I have put them under to deliver a budget bill in time. They have been working at pace over this last week to do it. Departments cannot access fund from the consolidated fund unless it is approved through a budget bill. Our advance for contingencies is limited to a percentage of last year. It's very small. We don't have a specific date that it will happen on because each department will exhaust its different. cash limits at different times. It's very hard to predict. Why we're asking this three is we want to avoid any risk of that. And can I just ask one question, which is one further question, then I'm going to ask the vice chair briefly. Um, do you anticipate that we will get a budget number one bill for 24, 25 in sort of June time with that number, or is it before then? We, we would hope that that would be the case, yeah. but obviously there are risks around that given the uncertainties around the details of that. So we, we may also ask for a larger voting account to make sure that we don't have that, but we'd certainly be aiming to bring it through before summer recess. Yeah. We wouldn't Should, want to. Do you be willing to give us a guarantee now that you will not be asking for it, or by you will not be asking for accelerated passage for that budget number one bill? <laughs> <laughs> you can never say never. You don't know what's going to happen. Um, it certainly wouldn't be what we're aiming for. We would aim to have the normal process for that. Just on that, can I? Can I just bring it down yeah. first and then? And then you can come in, Paul. Yeah, and thanks very much. And um, I just to echo what the chair had said. You know, the accelerated passage is ultimately you know, where, we, where we don't want to be, but um, obviously working with the department where we can. But I just wanted to ask in terms of the conditional, conditionality of the financial package. So you were saying that this um, budget bill for this year to take account of the financial package. To me, on the reading of the letter, there is this um, ambiguous degree of conditiona conditionality that you're only going to get money to apply into this year if you commit to the other things like the revenue raising. So until we get a response back, um, or see the response coming back to the Minister, are we in a position to, to detail that now or do we have access to anything until um, the Minister receives that clarity? We have access to the funding this year. The bit that is conditional is whether we have to pay it back in future years or not. So we do have the access to the one billion and forty five million now for this year and to repay the twenty two twenty three reserved claim. We we have access to that funding in twenty three twenty four. The conditionality is about the repayment of five five nine million of that. Okay. Is that not, uh, Paul? Again, on, on Matthew's point about what happens if uh, what happens if we don't have a budget 24-25 by April, or does the budget bill next week resolve that issue to a certain degree? It will give us a vote and account which will allow departments to spend on the basis of that, so they will be able to draw cash from the 1st of April. Right. It will be based on a vote and account as opposed to a specific budget position, so it's a percentage of the previous year. But they will, once they have a budget position, be constrained to that budget position. So it allows, it, it's a normal process. We normally have a vote and account. It's normally set at 45%. We will ask for it to be, if the executive is agreeable, to, to be slightly higher, just to allow a bit of wriggle room. So as we're not rushing a budget bill through, yes, so as okay. we're not in this position again, that's why we'd ask for an increased vote and account, but we will still aim for normal time scales. Uh, some in my head says J July, there's a period around July then, with regards yes. to that 45% spend. Yes, usually yes. budget, you then so, you require so you, budget. You would two. basically need, you would, that would be a set target then for that new budget 24-25 yeah. to go. We would ask for an increase in the voting account to allow us a little bit of regular room in case we couldn't get royal assent before as you say July but we would hope that wouldn't be the case we would need a budget agreed by the executive for 24-25 before we bring forward a budget bill so it's all interrelated but we'd be working to try to go to normal times. And, and Chair if I could just add I, I don't want it to be only on, on Joanne's shoulders as the senior official in the department I would definitely not be in a position sitting here asking for that accelerated passage if we thought there was any other way to do it 
It is an uncomfortable position, but we only have six weeks left. So in terms of what decisions you could meaningfully take, even if there wasn't the more pressing issue about cash. So certainly from, from the Permanent Secretary's point of view, I just wanted to put that on record. I don't believe, and I'm happy to stand over that, that there's any alternative uh, because the risk of departments running out of cash is too high. But just to say, it's worth reiterating the, the budget is a sort of strategic, it's allocating money in a, in a strategic way. It's essentially a strategic policy making document. The budget bills are setting the legal limits through which departments spend money, and we are in a better position to scrutinise the budget bills if we have that po- they have that strategic policy making document. Ideally, as you say, Paul, connected to a programme for government. So I'd echo that. Unless anybody has any more for any more, I'm going to release our thank prisoners so for the afternoon and say thank you. We will be back. There's a, a, that was really useful. We went through quite a few things. A few questions still to ask, but I do appreciate you all coming here today, and hopefully this is the beginning of um, lots of engagement, um, sometimes testing, but hopefully always productive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Everyone, thank you um, very much. And thanks to, again to Tony, Joanne and Neil. Thank you. No, um, agenda item... Uh, so actually, we've got to go to talk, we're going to talk about the budget bill, yes. So, um, uh, members, uh, as we've just discussed briefly with the officials, we um, we are going to be asked to uh, grant accelerated passage. We don't have to make that decision today, by the way. So members should be aware that you know you are, it is well you're well within your rights to to go away and consider that. And then that we but we um, we're going to have a meeting. So what we, uh, we we need to seek agreement on two things. Number one, um, that we have to write to the speaker highlighting that there is a request to grant accelerated passage. We've already received the request from the department. We have, a, a negotiations have already been working with the Speaker, yeah. hence why you see the the um, order papers for Monday and Tuesday are yeah. already making provision of this, but it's a formal issue that the committee must write to the Speaker to flag up the fact that a, an accelerated passage yeah. has been requested. So, I, mean, I would just say, though, though we... Just a moment, Jeremy, 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 I'll give you a second one. I would just, I would just say before I let you in, I want to let you in. Um, bear in mind, even if we do grant accelerated passes, and clearly there are strong arguments for it, it's worth us all bearing in mind that we have a unique responsibility on this committee to consider our, they are actually, I think, statutory responsibilities. This is the only statutory committee which has this power. Any other bill can be granted accelerated passage, but they can only really be granted by the whole assembly. That for the for a budget bill to get accelerated passage, it, it's the finance committee. So just bear that. that I'm not that is not me saying people we should we should delay it because there are very strong reasons, and we'll discuss it on Monday. There are very strong reasons to grant it, but I just want people. I, I want to put on the record that there there is a particular context and a particular responsibility um, for people to um, even if we uh, decide to grant it, um, that people consider that. Um, so before we come on to that, Jerry, did you want to come in? Yeah, just we're getting an official from the department on Monday. Yes. Yeah. So the the official who drafts the budget bill will be the one leading the the briefing. Yes. Um, and just anticipating that, um, if it's not in our packet, I think I missed it. But can we get uh, the consolidated fund? How much that is? Well, some names you ask these. It seems to be straightforward questions in previous experience, and 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 it's kind of we'll get back to you given the, the time sensitivity of that. So if we can, it's only fun to sort of the bank account. Yeah. It's hard, like this is like from my old world. It's kind, of, it's kind of hard. Like I'm not sure how much. It's not like an account where there's, but we can ask for like a definition from the department. Definition and also, which is let's just let's like just say let's I think just it's UK ask. Why the consolidated fund isn't it, or is it? Or a question and see what they can tell us. Or maybe not to direct you, Clark, out of your role, but you know, in terms of maybe advance warning, that, you know, certainly myself and others may ask questions about what, that. Sort what, of thing. what we want to get into as we go down this road, and it's it's one of the functions for the finance committee to highlight issues to other committees, is an issue like drawdown from the consolidated yeah. fund. That's something that, that the finance committee hears about. Other committees may not necessarily be oh, hearing no. that. And it's something that potentially, and if you want to deal with it now, we, we quickly can, is highlighting to other committees that potentially they might want to ask questions about the drawdown from the consolidated fund and get a regular update on that. Potentially, yeah. I mean, that's what I mean. Like, I think it'll actually come up in the legacy paper yeah. for, from the previous committee, which is one of the things. One of the things we talked about is, and this is not a political point, is lack of understanding of the budget process. And to be honest, I include that among you know, like the body politic and click and the us and the. It is very, very technical, and there's a real job of technique we have to brief ourselves, and um, and and that's why I'm always pointing out the difference between the budget bill and the budget document because they are two different. One's a legal process, and the other's a sort of strategic policy process. So I, I think it's totally reasonable to get, if we could get th- 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 a brief. Uh, Chair, also probably worth talking about. There's a, a little handbook in your packs 
um, we will the glossary, make, of, the glossary terms, of, yeah. of terms, which is really useful. But you can, I'm, I'm going to try and get those as a physical, it's a little pocket size book. I haven't got one to hand, I have one upstairs in the drawer. Um, you'll see finance officials carrying them about. It's on the department's website, right, and that's so. the link we've put in. But ideally, I'd like the little hand bound, sort of pocket size copy. Just, just on this point, yes. because we, we have experienced this before, both yourself, Chair, and myself, and others who have been on this committee. The scrutiny disconnect mm -hmm. around budgets is phenomenal and it needs to tighten up greatly. Now, that's not on us because, quite frankly, there is no. There needs to be better discussion and understanding even between scrutiny committees yes. and timely talks as to what they're actually should be looking at and for. And if you're a member, an MLA on an R committee, like agriculture, you think you want to talk about cows and sheep and trees and everything else, but you don't necessarily want to get into nuts and bolts of pounds and pence when really you need to. So there is this issue which I do believe that we need to, uh, there is a massive disconnect of scrutiny. Yeah, indeed, and I think like like a big part of going through is just I think people being open about us testing officials and not kind of mystifying us with yeah. with uh, or, or trying to mystify people with tech language. So I, I, we, the clerk will take that as an accident, I yeah. think, to kind of yeah. so that f for Monday session um, we'll have that. So, but if members uh, are agreed, we'll write to the speaker highlighting the request to grant accelerated passes we have to do, and then if members are agreed, we will have an additional meeting. At, is it midday? Yeah, it's, I, it's we originally would plan for twelve thirty, but now seeing the uh, timings that have to go out for the order paper, let's call it twelve o'clock. We provide um, refreshments for that as well, so you can come straight there. Okay, sure. can I just check just yes. in terms of emergency meetings? As I'm new to this, um, some of us will have other commitments in the chamber. Um, I see the economy minister is also to outline his vision. So, I just wanted to check. Have we got an idea of how long that meeting on Monday may or may not last? It has to be over before second stage of the, the bill starts, which is at one thirty-seven. I'm going to say. And what I would say is... We should be looking at an hour. Yeah, I mean, Max, but I mean, like, like I would say this, um, and I don't want, I'm not going to preempt, like, Neil and Joanne have clearly said a very clear rationale, and like, Joanne McBurney is a very trusted official. Um, this is very suboptimal that we're doing this is the very first thing politically, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we need to, as it were, you know, be um, push the nuclear button on this in terms yes. of accelerated passes. But people should obviously, people have totally have the right to go away and consider this and think about it. I, I think it's probably not the, be the best place for us to be to get to go in with an open ended discussion on Monday with people um, sort of undecided and wanting to hear hours of evidence about the pros and cons of accelerated passage. So uh, I think ideally we'll keep it, th that meeting should be relatively concentrated and focused. And if people, um, are going to have significant concerns and are minded to. This is up to other. I can't. If people are minded to, you know, object to it, um, I think you know they should say early on. Chair, there'll also be scope, obviously, in second stage exactly. for that's the, that's the big debate. Not that we're not getting a debate. By the way, this doesn't all like the, 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 we we yeah, are we have to debate yeah, every stage yeah, of the bill. Yeah. There will be an early ability to amend it or at least put down amendments. Um, it'll all be very concentrated and very quick. Yeah. But um, and that is objectionable in its own way. Um, as they've acknowledged. Okay, if members are content, then we will move forward to um, actually chair's business. I think so. We yeah. do that first, which we didn't do the last time. And there are a couple of additional items. I'm sort of scroll back items through four, the many, four. however many dozens of statutory rules that we um, yeah. went through earlier on. Uh, so it is agenda item four. Ten. Four. Um, so, uh, members, this is chairperson's business, which will. I have an additional item at the end, which I will suggest and actually addresses one of the points you rightly raised, Deirdre. Um, but uh, uh, under uh, chairperson's business, uh, number one, um, there is. It's in your pack, I believe. There's an invitation from NI Water uh, for an invitation for the committee to attend a tour of the NI Water treatment works across NI and or the Belfast Waste Water Treatment Works in Duncrew. So, members. Feel free, and I would recommend it. I mean, they, pop, they, they may be making, starting to make the case for the uh, sort of sustainable funding for themselves, and, and, and why not? They're a, a body. That, um, so, um, but if members wish to, um, uh, if members wish to contact them, I would advise them to do so uh, via NI Water directly. Um, uh, my, everyone's content with that, yeah. Uh, myself um, and the yeah. deputy chair had a. Um, had an informal meeting with the minister on the 7th of February and welcomed the fact that Kiva was very swift and very um, 
uh, good about organising that meeting and her private office was. It was a, obviously um, because she was just in her role and we were even more recently in ours, we didn't, it was a little bit more brief, it wasn't that we didn't discuss the, um, we didn't discuss um, uh, endogenous growth theory as they used to we, uh, we had a brief discussion about essentially what we talked about today, which is basically when the financial package was coming from the Treasury and um, we touched on the fact that there would be a request for accelerated passes for a budget bill and um, and we uh, and Neil and I think Joanne was Joanne on the call or was it just Neil? No, it was Neil and hey, another Tony. Tony, Tony yes. Tony, yeah. So we had a good we had a, we had a good discussion and um, it was obviously relatively brief, but um, hopefully we'll set the tone for a um, a good constructive relationship going forward. And we welcome again the getting the <coughs> early side of the day one brief. Um, okay, uh, next item is Brexit papers for the committee for finance. Uh, members, the NI Assembly, uh, the NI Assembly's EU Affairs Manager. Um, if you think you've got a lot of documents to read, the uh, <laughs> promise you, the, uh, the Assembly of uh, Seanan McGain has uh, a, a lot and um, has provided two Brexit papers for the uh, for the committee, starting at page forty three of the meeting pack. Um, so, if members want to have a quick look, they relate uh, um, to um, uh, in broad terms the Windsor Framework and public. Uh, procurement, they are, I think, um, uh, the specific actions that they request are uh, involved following up with Department of Finance officials uh, requesting briefings. So, um, if people are happy, we will contend and, and, and bear in mind if there's any additional things, we, we will be able to raise these in uh, at further meetings. Um, so, we will pursue those actions recommended by um, the uh, EU Affairs Manager if people are content. Great. Um, public expenditure terminology. Um, uh, now this relates to the document I think we were just, just yes, discussing the glossary, yeah, yeah, which is yeah. um, it's a page seventy seven and soft copy. Uh, if you are downloading it or like uh, like there are there were small like we those have, I yeah, have one somewhere. They are actually very like genuinely. If you can, yeah. if the if the department has them, I'm happy. Should we make a request? Going, for, I, if we ask for those, because we, I think we spend found money. some <laughs> in the office. <laughs> they are good to have. Literally have them by your side when you're when you're doing evidence is actually useful because there sometimes be terms that are. Um, we should so, put that into Dallow's reader. Yes, that would be good. I think if people are for that, just I think it would be a good thing for everyone to have. Um, then departmental consultations, members at page one five seven of the meeting pack. There, um, uh, uh, though the majority of these are now closed, um, yeah. it, it's worth looking at. Indeed, some of them were talked about earlier on uh, around rates rising. I think it is worth saying. Um, I mean, I made my points, uh, and others did around um, you know exe- the executive position re revenue raising. It is just worth putting on the record. In fairness, those consultations are not executive policy, so um, it's it, it'll be up to them. Obviously, there'll be information that they may or may not want to use, but I think I mean, it's not executive policy. And, and they were and Neil Gibson was clear. Anyone who's in the meetings uh, during when the institutions were down that they weren't exec, you know, that they were they were being directed to do them by the NIO. Now, whether they whether they are the basis of action, we'll see. So, um, but if there's consensus, we could get briefing. Yeah, I, I the think the one, the one on the financial context of revenue raising consultation that I raised there with them, which ended in January, I think it would be useful just to see what the nuts and bolts of that result of that consultation was. Chair, it might be handy at this stage just to take a, a, an approach to consultations. Generally, a committee will insert itself as the super consultee, and what that basically means is it allows the committee not to have to respond to a consultation, but once the consultation exercise is done and officials bring the analysis, yep. that allows the committee at that point to decide how it feels and put its contribution forward. So if, if members are going to, that would be the general approach we would take. Um, it, it's not appropriate for the committee to have to respond to a consultation. It should have the consultation brought to it and yep. be part of the... Yeah, I personally don't think it's appropriate for a committee to respond yep. to it, con- unless it's... I, th- I think there might be certain circumstances yeah. in which, for example, on things like you know, like what we're just talking about, like clarity of the budget making process. But uh, most of the other things I think are capital P political. Okay, uh, members are content with that approach. Uh, interparliamentary forum members. The next meeting of the interparliamentary forum will be held on Thursday, 29th of February, at the House of Lords. When the Assembly wasn't meeting, the EU Affairs Manager attended the meetings as an observer. As an observer, the agenda hasn't issued yet, but it is expected to cover issues including intergovernmental relations and scrutiny, um, discussions in previous and future meetings of the EU UK parliamentary. Partnership Assembly and a briefing from a minister from DLOC, that's the levelling up department to cover matters including the Shared Prosperity Fund, um, uh, yeah, an important um, thing to find out about given how much of a disaster it's been, um, that's not in the brief I should say. Um, yep. the, meeting, the meeting will begin at 9.30 and finish four members at approximately 2.30. 
Um, a written update from each legislature was re- on relevant activity since the last meeting is circulated in advance of the meeting. And um, members, the proposal is that I, as chair, attend the forum accompanied by the clerk, and that was the previous practice, I believe, with um, chairs. If people are content with that, um, and Great. hopefully. I haven't, my wife isn't watching, so I haven't sought her agreement to that yet. So, um, no, I have an additional thing that I wanted to bring up under chairperson's business, which is that in the previous mandate, something that we attempted to do and didn't succeed in, because basically of the obduracy of the Treasury, was getting, a, was getting evidence from either a minister or an official. My proposal, given what we have talked about today and the, I think, degree of consensus that at a bare minimum, we need that the UK government has given um, some. Uh, w- uh, well, there's a, a lot of agreement that, that there should be a greater package and a backdated package, but there's also an agreement that they that this deserves to be scrutinised. So I would suggest that as of now, that we write to the Treasury to try and get um, ideally uh, evidence from the um, a Treasury Minister, the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, and or. Uh, perhaps in addition to which the, the Northern Ireland office, I think that would be uh, totally within, uh, I think that would be totally reasonable, particularly given, in addition to the, the questions over the scale of the financial package, there is also the question of um, the Public Service Transformation Board. Um, now they may say that's subject to negotiation with the executive, but they have put these proposals down. So I think it's reasonable for us to invite them. And I say invite politely, but I think we should strongly request their presence and that will follow up. And after that, we may want to take further actions as a committee. I think we also, well, I would like to promote that we write to them um, that they need to be engaging with the finance minister and the executive on the issue um, of the budget um, of the transformation funds. Um, and of uh, the Barnet formula um, in terms of need. So we would be encouraging them um, not to be doing this in the public arena or on a radio show in terms of giving briefings, yeah. but there should be the direct engagement with ministers here um, that are elected um, by the people here and that they should be doing that without further delay. No issue in terms of this committee yeah. providing a scrutiny role in terms of public spending overall. But if we could, um, on the same basis as the Assembly was supportive overall last week, um, you know, that the British government does need to engage urgently on these matters, um, I think that would be a good message to send if this committee could also endorse that approach. Can I suggest um, that we may want to... So, I, I mean, I would be cautious about doing a kind of uh, a broad committee letter until we know what the executive position is and where the exact you know what the response is but i wonder if we start a process which could result in that by requesting i mean and we can we can put our we, we can also say there's there's you know the high level of public interest and the, and indeed we can even point to the political consensus around the need which was reflected in the motion we can point to in our letter requesting we can point to the degree of political consensus around the need for a greater you know greater support um, just I just think that the point that the member is making is, you know, there's a clear, well, decision that's been made by the House last week in relation to our great position, um, ably amended by yourselves, um, that put out the clear that all executive parties and the opposition are united in ensuring that we get a fair funding package um, for Northern Ireland. The letter then from the Finance Minister yesterday in response to the letter from the Chief Secretary to the Treasury makes clear that there needs to be direct engagement between herself, the Executive and Treasury to get this sorted. So the point that Deidre is making um, I would support because I think there's a clear consensus that we are calling for that direct engagement and quick direct engagement. I understand and think it's useful that we provide a scrutiny role, but ultimately, you know, this committee will be our place to negotiate directly with Treasury. We want to see the executive being brought in to negotiate with that as soon as possible. You know, I respect that, and if that's the, the committee's consensus, is that we should write that letter. I mean, I would say by writing the letter, we are doing scrutiny. So if we're writing a letter to them, we are acknowledging that we have a role in engaging with. But can I suggest that the clerk goes away and drafts a letter which does both of those things, and we can discuss those drafts and our approach. Um, but I'm happy to take other comments on that. Yes. Perhaps should there be a, two separate letters? It, it, well, it could be two separate letters, but we could discuss, we could we could have one which is a which is one which is an invite and one which is a, a combination of invite and um, uh, and making and pointing to the fact that there was a motion, a successful, successfully amended motion. But yes, a successful motion in the assembly, sure. agreeing that the the UK government needs can to. I suggest dump I think one letter possibly having 
spent many years writing to UK government departments. I think two is probably for them to respond in, in a timely fashion is, is asking too much. Can I, can I suggest a letter that folds in everything then that's been said? So essentially, as you say, Chair, it will be seeking briefing because obviously the Department for Finance has an overarching role in management of the financial aid and therefore the committee needs to have a good understanding of how exactly the perspective of Treasury and NIO fits in with that. But again, as, as members have said, um, stressing the need for an, a quick and urgent response to the Minister's letter uh, seeking the urgent meeting um, that will, will allow the executive to engage yeah. um, and also then referencing the debate um, as well. I mean, with it, a link. So I'm happy, I, mean, I remember don't think we should ask a Treasury Minister here for scrutiny, please tell me. I think that's a, like an important thing for us to do. Oh, and I do agree, but that's just probably a longer term piece. What I'm keen to do is that we get that engagement between the executive and the Treasury now because I want this funding package sorted as soon as possible. I don't think we're going to have um, the Chief Secretary of the Treasury appearing on Monday um, at this committee. No, no, I don't think we know. I, I don't think that is likely. Actually, that might be the other useful thing to point out. That a letter now is putting a marker down that may take some time to deliver on, so we, we're not talking about anything. I think we'll know a lot more by the time we might even see officials, if that's yeah, helpful. But, but I also would say that we don't want to completely play ourselves into the negotiation process because no. we are a scrutiny committee. Um, Jerry, did you want to say something? Luckily, I mean, I'm for the executive being properly used on, but I mean, the executive can rightly raise that themselves. I'm sure they have already, and, and obviously our party and, and yours sure aren't on the executive, so I think there's a question of not conflating the two issues in the sense that there's an overlap, but also people in this committee and people who are not... Uh, on this committee and that, then the executive parties need to get some answers from Treasury officials, so I'm be strongly keen to have them in the room so we can ask them uh, a lot of questions and get some answers. So I don't think it's an either or, but there's a differentiation between people who are not on the executive and parties and getting that information, which you know, appreciate other parties might get. But there is obviously a distinction, but I think there is. I mean, there is consensus on, uh, I think, within the Assembly Chamber on what we voted on in relation to greater support and, and, and I, th I don't think that's controversial actually and it's important that we do reiterate that but then there is also a distinction between I suppose not even the political point about who's in or out of the executive but also our roles as scrutiny committee so I do I, personally as chair I would say it's important for us to be mindful of and, and this is a constitutional point within the assembly of the distinction of our role mm -hmm. as a scrutiny committee versus the role of the department but 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 I agree that there is we can do both. Well, of those I with that. I just think we're at a critical point here um, and rather than it being played out by briefings on a radio show that there needs to be the direct engagement and we're just calling for that so that yeah. then we can scrutinise something. Well, I definitely think, well, I definitely agree with that. Um, so if we could echo just those calls from this committee, I think particularly with the briefing that we've had from officials, I think would be would send a strong message. Okay, well, we, what, what I can suggest is if I get that, so just to watch you if I get that for yes. Monday, then you can actually see it before it okay. goes anywhere at the extra meeting. That, that makes sense. Okay, let's do that. Okay, is there... Um, so I think that is the I end of my chairperson's business. Do you want me to? Nine, but um, what I would suggest, Chair, is we, we haven't dealt with correspondence. Correspondence, a lot of that is simply for noting. So yeah, what I, I would suggest is we, we deal with correspondence via correspondence. So yes. all that means is I will email you directly with the correspondence table, which corresponds, overuse of the word, to your pack and seek agreement or suggestions on the actions that we have put forward and we do that within a time scale to clear it before next week otherwise it'll it'll never go away okay fine so that's is that item nine or that's item nine that's item nine yeah. okay well, so i'm going to jump forward then i think we're, we're i yes. can now jump forward to the yes. draft forward work, forward work program. program refer members to the draft forward work program page 921 and um, that includes what we're going to do in the next few weeks uh, it's worth pointing out, I think we've got the Fiscal Council. And we do. We have them on the 6th of March, uh, Sir Robert and probably Jonathan McAdams as well. Now, members uh, have referenced the Fiscal Council a number of times in the work they've done. I actually have some hard copies that are really useful yeah. around aspects of the budget and other things in the car. Should have brought them in earlier. But I will have those for you on yes. Monday. Yeah. I'll bring those on Monday. Sorry, I will check. Yeah, so yeah, just a question, Chair. Obviously, this is the draft forward work program to the end of this year, and we'll no doubt have conversation then about our priorities mm -hmm. moving forward. Yeah, yeah. When do we expect that that will happen? And the reason I ask is just that, given the conversation that we've just had, and given I think the consensus that has emerged around the funding formula, 
I think is a priority for this committee in terms of inquiry. Looking at that issue might be a good committee inquiry for us to, to do when the opportunity arises. Yes, and I think we do need a longer conversation and, and, and we would normally do that longer. We might normally have done it today if we hadn't had such a fulsome session about other priorities. Um, sure, we would plan to do that in two stages. Initially it would be the conversation carved out of a, a meeting, but also then taking it to a, a specifically designed strategic priority session. Usually we'd, we'd probably look to do that, I'm thinking in terms of where we are now um, in the term, probably looking to do that before... I'm going to say before the end of May. Um, the reason I say that is, and the reason why the, the forward work programme is not bunged, as to use a local word, Absolutely. is purely because we need this flexibility. Um, and, and I fairly much guessed that we would be looking to put in an awful lot more beyond those initial briefings. So we will have that conversation, um, ideally before Easter, and then try and do a bigger session once we've had all the kinds of initial briefings and so on that members have talked about, probably before the end of May. That's helpful, thank you. Okay, and, and I just I should say, like, there'll obviously be, I, I'm really keen to do this in a way that's just the inner gig in me that people, like, within reason, we have we have important stuff to, to manage, but if there are specific things that people want to raise and put on, I think it's really important that, because because this is such an important department and and there's other, including things like civil service reform, building regulations, you'll find little things in this department which you sort of slightly fell off the back of a lorry but um so um but we will be up the, the draft board work program is not set it's not it's in the tablets of stone okay uh so seek members view so agreement on the draft work it's provisional agreement it can always be updated um item 34 is uh correspondence which we uh which is a separate we're not going to go through all that correspondence now no we're, no, we're, we're, we're going to do it by correspondence Great, okay now, item 35 is um if anybody has any other business that they want to raise okay great um uh, agenda item 36 is uh, date, time and place of next meeting. Our next <coughs> meeting is scheduled for next Monday rather than next Wednesday, um, so obviously put it in your diaries, at 12.30 in room 12. 20. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. midday, high noon at uh, room 29. Room 29. So what ideally I would like to have to you for that meeting is not the letter aside and all the, the things I'm bringing in physical form, the draft budget bill. Um, we, we have a plan um, that we might be able to get it to you on Friday, so we put out a pack with it on Friday, but that's very contingent on the Minister getting it and the Minister having a chance to clear it before we can then send it out. So that is my plan. Do not be stunned if my plan goes horribly wrong and you get it on Monday when you're getting a brief. All the best plans never go to that. It's not by Friday, it will be Monday. Monday. It's not going to, and the letter, sorry, that we agreed there to go out when will we expect a draft of that, just so that we can come I back can to you? I put that through to you. If we get a pack on for Friday, I'll do it in a pack. If not, I'll send it to you an email. Okay. To generate a pack, we need kind of enough to make it work. So the letter just go out to you by email if we don't have a pack to send. Okay. So no, thank you. No. Okay. In that case, I'll see everyone on Monday. Thank Room you. 29. Room 29. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. 29. Committee Room 21, Sound. Committee Room 21, Sound.